forward to a future conversation, which during the workshop, it seemed all of us were very amenable to discussing the exempt properties, to ensure we were charging correctly, to ensure that everything was according to what we wanted because there are properties that we can say, yes, we want to charge this, um, those assessments. Because those conversations have not taken place, I think it is premature to have the approval of the methodology study. Does anyone else want to speak? To that, I think I have someone coming down. Mr. Speaks. Chuck Speaks, Public Works Director. Uh, first, the transportation impact fees. When we had that discussion, I believe that we, and I'll have to go back and, and listen to it again, I believe that we explained that we are in the process right now of updating to mobility fees. So there could be some concerns legally to try to increase that transportation impact fee and then change it to a mobility fee because there are <clears throat> restrictions to how often we can move that fee upward. Okay, so the exemptions, to go to the exemptions, uh, we did send that out. This isn't an easy thing to dig into. The exemptions that are, the properties that are exempt by regulation are pretty easy to sort out. The other properties that are exempt are exempt because at some point, the governing body has decided to exempt that, that type of property, okay? So to look at every one of these, we have to go back and try to find out where it was exempt. So the first thing we did was pull out ones that obviously look like they're, they're not quite right. If you have a residential vacant lot that's exempt, you know, that's one we're going to dig it into and try to find out why. Now the consultant has to look at that as well as us. We do that annually. We clean this up annually. It's a constant process because properties are sold. So if you, the memo that we sent out today, if uh, just the, the real quick hit on it, we have approximately 1,400 parcels that are mandatory exempt. Okay, those are ones that we can't touch. Those are ones that are exempt through regulation. So we have some remaining parcels that are discretionary exempt. So there's a total of 71 of those parcels. If this rate study or this methodology and the rates were increased as we have requested, the revenue from those 71 properties is $109,702, okay? Out of that $109,000, churches account for 82,000. So if you wanna take that big chunk, if you wanna recover that money, that's where it is. And that is at the discretion of the board. Uh, Vice Mayor. Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, I remember the uh, conversation we had in the in the workshop, and um, and I'm sorry, I don't have my notes with me, but I think this was the one where I did ask about whether the cost of finding those the answers was going to be outweigh what we actually would get back. And what, right now, you pointed out a little over a hundred thousand, and churches are eighty two thousand, so we would have to entertain the idea of not exempting churches anymore? Is that what you're saying, to have any kind of a, and, and that's not even, I'm sorry, substantial 82,000, but is that, would be the only leeway we would have out of that 190? There, there are 109,000. Out of that, the, uh, there's another, what was it 27,000 that's spread out across some others that are utilities. <coughs> there's some, a few thousand in those residential vacant lots that we're looking into. But it's it's a very minor number. It's it's you know less than five thousand. So, if you were looking to to recover the largest chunk of that, anything, and and if you guys have the memo, the pie chart, so everything in that blue is churches, mm -hmm. and it accounts for pretty much all of that. All right. And you said 
Um, Fourteen hundred is mandatory, so we have no say over that at Correct. all. And the seventy-one is that hundred nine thousand that includes eighty-two thousand for churches. That's correct. Okay. All right. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Vice Mayor, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, and I I appreciate the memo. I just wish we got it a little bit more timely, <laughs> so we could have had a, a better discussion one on one even. Um, it's important to make sure that we're collecting what we are legally able to collect from these properties. Um, and I don't want to single out churches because that would be unwise of us. Um, this 71 discretionary exempt properties have a multitude of uses. Um, many other municipalities in Sarasota County charge for stormwater, which is road and drainage. Um, Sarasota County charges these same properties that are on this little pie chart for stormwater. <clears throat> I am only trying to make sure that we are not leaving money on the table and that the rest of the citizens and the rest of the property owners are not picking up something and paying for something that others are getting at no charge. That is, that's not fair, it's not equitable, and it's not wise. Um, so that's why when we had the discussion during the workshop, it was asked to bring this back prior to the discussion to approve these rates. And if, if I can just interject for a second. Go ahead. What, what the commission is approving right now is our methodology. You will decide on the rates when we bring it back. We'll do a not to exceed, and then you'll have to ex do that resolution to accept the rates. And those rates will be whatever percentage the commission decides that's going to be the increase based on what they were last year. Uh, this is the methodology that, that again, and I, I want to caution commission because we're kind of in the boat that we're in because we do all these, cert these studies and these methodologies, and then we bring it to commission, and they decide they want to do half of that, or they want to do a third of that, or they don't accept it at all as far as the rate side of it. And that's where we end up, where we end up, you know, with a substantial increase in one time. Commissioner McDowell. To be clear, I'm not suggesting we not adopt these rates. I am suggesting we increase the revenues by that $100,000. And yes, it's a small amount compared to the total assessment. But if we approve the study today, we lose the ability to charge these exempt properties when we come back for budget and when we do the not to exceed and when we do the final budget. We have to do that now is my understanding from previous conversations with the methodology for road and drainage. I don't believe that's accurate 100 percent so we every year we go through the exempt properties and we pick out the ones that shouldn't be exempt and we change that when we notice that property it doesn't come to commission methodology and the exemptions are different if we find a property that's exempt that wasn't commission exempt that wasn't discretionary it was an error then we can change that if commission decides to change their policy on a certain type of property you can do that at any time. It doesn't have to be when you accept the methodology. The only thing that's going to do is possibly change the revenues that come in. So you could, you could end up with more revenue than what we had proposed in the methodology. But that doesn't have to happen at the adoption of, of methodology. the methodology. We can, we can change those exemptions as mm -hmm. the board sees fit. So when could we have that conversation to get commission direction to charge for the 71 discretionary exempt properties identified here? I would say that that would be something I would ask the commission to bring if they want to start exempting or taking away exemptions. I'd say that that's something the commissioner would ask or that the board would ask to put on the agenda, not road and drainage. So... Mm -hmm. I think it's time for a motion. Would someone like to make a motion on this item? I'll make a motion. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Go ahead. I'll make a motion to approve the final revisions to the road and drainage district rates and methodology study completed by Stantec Consulting Services, Incorporated. 
We have a motion on the floor to approve the final revisions to the road and drainage district rates and methodology study completed by Stantec Consulting. Do I have a second? I do. Boy, that's a jump ball. Um, I'll take Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that, gentlemen? And let's vote. I'd like to. Oh, win. I'm sorry, Commissioner McDowell. I just saw you. So, I've already stated I don't have a problem with the methodology. My problem lies with not including the exempt properties. And if I approve this and I make another motion to bring back the exempt properties for commission review, which I pretty much think was covered when we had that consensus at the workshop. Will that be done in time for fiscal year 24 budget between now and September? We have the list of properties. We have the types of properties that are exempt. So we could probably get that back in the next couple of months. It will, again, doesn't have a huge impact. $100,000. Not, it's not a huge impact to the road and drainage budget mm -hmm. or the assessments. Um, but we can, I mean, I, go ahead, sir. I believe what he's saying is it cost effective to do that based on what he's already done and the will of the board to send us in that direction. It is going to take time and effort. Of, and if it's the will of the board, then that's what he'll do. But that's where he's stuck right now. We, we have a motion yeah. on the floor. I think we've beaten this topic to death. So let's take a vote, and then we'll see if any other motions come forward. Do you have everything you need, City Clerk? OK, then let's vote, please. And that motion passes four to zero. Four to one. I'm sorry, four to one. Boy, I am just really bumping along. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Mayor, may I make a motion? Go ahead. I'd like to make a motion to instruct the city manager and staff to bring forward, with the help of the city attorney, um, the commission's. Um, sorry, I'm trying to reword this. The city manager and the city attorney and staff to bring forward a, an agenda item including the 71 discretionary exempt properties to remove the exemption as as necessary I don't know how else to name that I'm struggling. With I'm that struggling with the bit. motion. I'm, what I'm here's what I'm trying to do, and help me with the wordsmithing of the motion, if we, yep. if you, we could, is to have the city manager bring forward the necessary documents to change the exemption based on each one of the parcels. Well, I'm I'm having difficulty bringing forward an agenda item. That is a solution. Um, I think if we were bringing forward an agenda item to review that list one more time to decide whether or not we wanted to continue it as exempt. That's kind of what I thought we gave direction for consensus during the workshop, and we're right back to the same discussion. Um, so I, I say it again the way you worded it and um, so the motion is to instruct staff to bring forward an agenda item to just to determine whether or not to remove churches as an exemption. All right, I'll make a motion. Make a motion to have the city manager and city attorney bring forward an agenda item to remove the road and drainage exemption from the exempt properties with a list of each property and its potential revenue for further discussion within the next 60 days because Jeff said that would be about how long it would take. 
City Clerk, could you repeat what you have? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have it? To have the city manager and city attorney bring forward an agenda item to remove the road and drainage exemption from the exempt properties with a list of each property and its potential revenue for further discussion within the next 60 days. Thank you. Okay. Do I hear a second? And that motion fails for lack of a second. So let's move on to public hearings resolution number 2023-R-29. Um, City Clerk, could you read this item by title only? Resolution number 2023-R-29, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Northport, Florida, as the governing body of the Northport Road and Drainage District, accepting a temporary access and drainage easement located in a portion of sections 28, 29, 32, and 33, Township 39 South, Range 21 East, Sarasota County, Florida, referenced as Sarasota County Property Appraisers, parcel identification number 09990010, providing for incorporation of recitals, providing for recording, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you, City Clerk. City Manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Sable Trace Development Partners, LLC, is redeveloping a portion of its property in Sarasota County. Uh, during construction, a temporary access and drainage easement is required to preserve the city's existing drainage rights. When the entire central park development is constructed, the temporary easement will be replaced with a permanent easement. The city will not be responsible for the cost of any design, construction, routine repair, or replacement of the existing or planned stormwater drainage facilities through Central Park site and the temporary easement. Um, we ask that you approve this as its corrective form as approved by our legal team. Thank you, city manager. I'm opening the floor to commission questions. I'm not seeing any, so let's move on to public comment. Uh, do we have any, City Clerk? We do not. Online, I don't see any in-house. So I am going to close this public hearing and request a motion. I'll make a motion. Go ahead, Commissioner. I move to adopt resolution number 2023-9-29 as presented. Second. I have a motion on the floor to adopt resolution number 2023-R-29 made by Commissioner Stokes and seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that? And let's vote. And that motion passes five to zero. Any final public comment, City Clerk? There is none. And there is none in house. It is 423, and I am adjourning um, this uh, road and drainage district governing body meeting. Thursday, March 30th, 2023, it is 424, and I call the Solid Waste regular meeting to, to order. Commissioners present are the same as our previous meeting. There is a quorum. All of our charter officers and other folks on the dais are still here. Um, I am looking for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. We have a motion on the floor to approve the agenda made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Let's vote. And that motion passes five to zero. City Clerk, is there any online public comment? There is none. There is none in house, so let's move on to the consent agenda. City Manager, have any items been pulled on this agenda? No, ma'am. Then I am looking for a motion. I'll make a motion. I move to approve the items in the consent agenda. 
We have a motion on the floor to approve the items in the consent agenda made by Commissioner Stokes and seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Let's vote. And that motion passes five to zero. Moving on to public hearings, resolution number 2023-R-19. A city clerk, can you read this by title only? Resolution number 2023-R-19, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Northport, Florida as the governing body of the Solid Waste District, authorizing the purchase of real property located on Silverleaf Road and described as Lot 27 and 28, Block 2276, 47th edition to Port Charlotte Subdivision, Sarasota County Property Appraiser Parcel Identification Number 112-822-7627 and 11 or 112-822-27628, incorporating recitals, providing for filing of documents, providing for conflict, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. City Manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. As it relates. Um, to this item, the Solid Waste District is requesting the City Commission to approve the purchase of the property of the two parcels currently owned by Elvin Gravini. And Public Works has worked with Arlena Dominic, Consultant Project Manager of the American Acquisition Group, to purchase these properties. Agre an agreement has been reached um, with Ms. Gravini to sell these properties to the Solid Waste District at a value of $18,000. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that, city manager. Um, opening it up to commissioner questions. Commissioner McDowell. I don't have a question. Would now be an appropriate time to comment? Certainly, go ahead. I just wanted to say thank you to staff for updating that map very quickly and, and adding a lot of additional information. It was extremely helpful and looks like we only have one more to go. <laughs> thank you. City Clerk, is there any public comment? There is none. Uh, there's none in-house either, so I am looking for a motion. We'll make a motion, Mayor. Go ahead, Commissioner. Make a motion to approve resolution number 2023-R-19 as presented. We have a motion on the floor to adopt resolution number 2023-R-19 made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that? And let's vote. And that motion passes five to zero. City Clerk, any online public comment? Seeing that there is none in house, it is 4.28 p.m. and I am adjourning the Solid Waste District meeting.
Good evening, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 30th, 2023. It is 6 p.m. and we are in city chambers. I call the city commission regular meeting to order. Commissioners present are Commissioner McDowell, Commissioner Stokes, myself, Vice Mayor Langdon, um, Vi um, <laughs> Mayor Langdon, Vice Mayor White. It's been like this all evening, so I'll apologize. One blanket apology. It's been rocky. Um, so Vice Mayor White and Commissioner Emmerich. There is a quorum present for this meeting. Also present are City Manager Fletcher, Deputy City Attorney Golan, City Clerk Faust, okay. Recording Secretary Powell, Police Chief Garrison is up in the back, and Deputy Chief Fire Chief Lane is representing our fire department. Mr. Derek Applegate, would you lead us in the pledge, please? To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm requesting a motion to approve the agenda. Second. We have a motion on the floor to approve the agenda made by Commissioner Emmerich and seconded by Commissioner McDowell. Let's vote. And that motion passes five to zero. We are moving on to our public comment section. We have a very full house today, so I just want to remind everyone when other folks are giving public comment, it's very important that you keep quiet. It's very difficult for us to hear up here if there's chatter going on in the room. So I'll really, really appreciate everyone being quiet during public comment. City Clerk, do we have any online public comment? We do not. And do we have any in-house public comment? Yes, we do. Joan Morgan? Hi, Joan Morgan, Northport. I um, want to thank the city for all that they're doing for Easter. It's always unbelievable, and, and it's really very important. And I hope some of you will be part of it. So uh, that's a great thing. I want to talk to you someday about something which I hope we never get involved with. I'm involved with right now, and it's going to cost us a lot, but the city really isn't, and that's seawalls. I really would like some feedback as to what the city's going to do, because there are a number of seawalls um, actually just up the street from me, which were put in by general development, and if they all go around the Biscayne waterway in that, it's unbelievable. The new ruling is, and this is from uh, the State Department, that there is a new um, Hurricane Restoration Reimbursement Grant Program, which everything has to be in by July 1st, and that means seawalls up and paid for. And under uh, uh, commit, or Buchanan's office has said that that actually would cover seawalls. However, there's a little problem. Um, you go higher than that, and they say, only beach seawalls, okay? So I guess um, we need to put a sign out there saying Fabian Road Beach, okay? Because uh, soil erosion is soil erosion, okay? Ponte Gorda has, has, better, um, has better taken care of the situation than we have because a future hurricane, we might be in the situation they are. They are replacing, they have 1,050 panels already to be replaced by April 10th. They are uh, doing 7.25 miles of, of uh, seawall uh, reconstruction because of Ian, 6.5 in Ponte Gorda, and 0.75 in Burnstore uh, area. Um, and we really need to have some programs because there is nothing. Your home insurance pays zero on seawalls. FEMA flood insurance pays zero on seawalls. I've lived on a canal for 50 years. I paid the Florida um, um, flood insurance for all those years, thinking it did pay for seawalls or help for seawalls. 
zero. Okay, so there is absolutely no help. Seawalls cost, uh, the estimates we have are going from 46,000 to close to 70,000. And with a 30 year SBA mortgage, which my husband and I will pay off when he's 109, okay, um, it'll cost us probably 70 or $80,000. And that's just the way it is. And we're not the only ones. But as I say, Northport, there's a lot of seawalls that are really dealing with the area of Northport. So it would be good if we could work on a policy and had it in place. Thank you. And thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for the canals being um, uh, cleaned out. Oh my gosh, we just sat there and clapped for those boats. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Morgan. The next three, if you could just come stand over here, would be Samantha Gentra, Christian Ibarra, and Brianna Waite. And you'll have three minutes each. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Samantha Gentrup, and I have the pleasure of being a teacher here in Northport. I teach sixth grade language arts at Woodland Middle School, and it's a wonderful school with amazing students, and I've got a lot of them in the audience tonight, and my heart is just bursting with joy because I'm so proud of them. Um, they've been working for weeks on a research project in which they pick topics about the environment that they're passionate about, and they, they research those topics. Tonight, they're going to read letters to you uh, in which they will explain the problem, the causes, the effects, and they're going to ask you for some solutions to implement that are completely relevant to here in Northport. So um, I believe our greatest gift that we can give children is to help them find their voice. And so to have an overwhelming number of them show up tonight to, to read. Um, many of them have never done this before, so they're nervous. Uh, they've never done a project of this extent, so I just ask you to listen um, with grace as well. And, um, and I just want you to know that they're your upcoming citizens, voting citizens here in Northport, and, and their voices are, are very important. So thank you for letting them speak tonight. Thank you, ma'am. Um, hello, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners. Uh, I would just like to introduce myself as Krishna Ibarra. And today I'm going to be reading a letter, which is more on the state level, but I still want you to hear my concerns about overfishing because I am still a citizen here and I really want you to hear this. Man, the water is so relaxing, clear with so many fish, nothing in the water. My dad and I have, would have the time of our lives. That's what my dad remembers. Well, we've been here for four hours. There's no fish. The water is murky. And there's trash all over the place. My dad asks, what's happening? I said environmental destruction. There's so many environmental issues. Plastic pollution, sea level rise, red tide, that all contribute to our ocean's decline. But this is on overfishing. So what I'm asking is for you to please make an effort to try to save our Florida oceans. Now, at least for me, I want to be able to take my children to the Florida Keys and enjoy a nice fishing trip. But without your guys' help, I can't do that, and many others can. Overfishing is happening all over the world, especially in Florida. Overfishing is when fish are taken from the sea faster than they can reproduce. The fish population gets smaller and smaller until eventually overfishing can lead to certain species of fish being wiped out entirely. This means when fish get caught in the hundreds, they get taken too quick before the population can get back until eventually there's no seafood left. One of the main consequences of overfishing is bycatch. Bycatch normally happens while trawling, a method in which boats pull massive nets behind them in the water, and it pulls more than just shrimp and bluefin tunas. It captures about anything in its path. Sea turtles, dolphins, seabirds, snakes, and other animals that all face extinction threats. While trawling a method of catching fish, so many fish die in the process. One of the effects of overfishing is the food chain being messed up. Um, if the whole food chain gets, up, that gets messed up, um, both predators and prey can suffer from extinction. Um, one of the easiest ways to stop overfishing is to pass or revise different laws. One of the laws that should re be revisited is the Sustainable Fisheries Act of 1994. This act represents an uh, effort to address the problems we're facing with our nation's fisheries, both commercial and recreational, and will and will uh, provide 
important fishery resources. Now, at this point, this act is outdated, but it's not a lost hope. We can revisit and make this law up to date and bring it to Florida. Senator Gruders, I know you love fishing and eating a nice snapper that you caught earlier in the day, and I know you want um, and I know you want other people to have the same experience you did with the oceans. So please try to try to stop overfishing and environmental destructions. Sincerely, Christian Ibarra, Woodland Middle School. Thank you for listening to my letter. Good afternoon, dear Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners. I'm Brianna Lee from Woodland Middle School, and I'd like to tell you about some of my concerns. I love swimming, and I'm sure you do too. After all, we do live in Florida. <coughs> but we can't swim with all the plastic pollution. This plastic in our ocean will kill or harm in our animals, and they will wash up on shore, and that would just be a disgusting sight. If we do something about it, though, we might just be able to prevent plastic pollution. I've seen turtles appear on shore strangled to death by a plastic piece of trash. We don't want our animals to die because we put plastic pollution in our ocean. Plastic pollution can harm many animals in many ways. One of these ways is littering. It's very harmful to animals in our ocean. If it ends up in the ocean, some examples why this is harmful, harmful is storms wash up some plastic litter into our streets, which could lead to animals eating or trying to do something with that. If this litter ends up in our waters, it could severely hurt our animals. Another cause is people dumping their unwanted gear into our waters. Another example of this is this debris includes fishing lines, nets, and other lo items lost at sea, dumped overboard or abandoned when they become damaged or no longer needed. This could trap our sea animals or harm them. Both things are very harmful to our ocean. This plastic pollution is very harmful, harmful as I said, and has a lot of effects of it. Some of these harmful effects are killing our animals or trapping them or severely hurting them. Our sea animals are very important, but if we keep littering and it ends up in the ocean, it could very much severely <coughs> cause effects to our animals. A very important example of this is all the, all the missing plastic is worrisome because the smaller plastic bit becomes, the more likely it will make its way into an animal, whether it's a plankton or an enormous whale. Also, another effect is it could kill animals with all the litter and items we dump into our ocean. An example of this is young albatross has been found dead from starvation, their stomach filled with plastic garbage. These effects are very harmful to our sea animals. These are ways to stop plastic pollution. The first is to reduce using plastic items. I promise that this, is a, this solution will help. Here is an example. Although such examples of litter come easily to mind, they only hint at a serious, ongoing problem of plastic pollution. If we ban using plastic shopping bags, we will have less in plastic in our waters. Another solution would be recycling. Though not everyone recycles, we could change that. I'm asking that we put recycling bins in public places, especially parks. For example, these places have already done this. Germany, Miss, Australia. And I'm places. so sorry, but you're out of time. Okay, thank you for but listening thank to my you. letter. The next three are Harmony Westorp, Magnus Walker, and Carrie Smith. <laughs> Hello, my name is Harmony Westorp, and I am here to talk about one of the most important things. Dear Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners, sea level rise and destruction of water resources as glaciers melt alone may have horrendous human consequences, said by Noam Chomsky. You could be the change and save this generation of kids from flooding, losing their home, and losing a lot of their resources. Sea level rising ha can have a really big impact, not even just Northport, but also the whole state of Florida. A lot of this generation will experience about three feet of water rise in their lifetime. This means that all the water in the ocean could rise over cities, and we have a ton of water on Earth. Over 97.2% of Earth is covered in water. You might think this is good, this much water is good, but it could destroy your house one day. One thing that 
One thing causing sea level rise is releasing carbon dioxide into the air. And then that causes the water to heat up, and when water heats up, it expands, which causes the sea level to rise. The effects of sea level rise can cause houses to go underwater. It can even cause polar bears and other Arctic animals to lose their home. Sea level rise can be caused by a lot of things, but it is usually caused by burning fossil fuels. Sea level rise can cause erosion of beaches, inundation of deltas, as well as flooding and loss of many marshes and wetlands. We need those things for flood protection, water quality improvement, shoreline erosion control, natural products, recreation, and aesthetics. One thing that all the damage could do to your house is flood the inside and even possibly tear it down. There are a couple of solutions that can help with sea level rise. We could reduce the burning of fossil fuels, which could make the sea level rise rate go down by 50% and use solar panels. I'm not saying that we have to completely stop using burning fossil fuels, but if we reduce the burning of fossil fuels, it could help the whole state of Florida, including Northport. That's why, so to conclude, I'm asking the city of Northport to reduce how many fossil fuels we burn every day and save not just Northport, but our whole state. Thank you for listening to my letter. Thank you. Um, good evening, Vice, oh, sorry. Vice Mayor, Mayor, and Commissioners. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the effect of sea level rise. So, <laughs> sea levels were the same for thousands of years, but in the past 100 years, sea levels have changed drastically. This is startling, so we need to do something about it as fast as possible. Sea level rise is a global problem. When sea levels rise caused by burning fossil fuels, it spreads CO2 and carbon dioxide. Sea level rise is an increase in the level of the world's oceans due to the effects of global warming. This means that sea levels are constantly rising and not stopping due to us burning fossil fuels. People are burning fossil fuels because that's how we power our items, but many don't know by doing this, the sea levels are rising constantly. To help explain this more, studies show that sea level rose between 1.2 millimeters and 1.7 millimeters per year on average. Sea level rises causing during, oh, sea level rises causing areas to flood, and that's happening just so we can power our cars and houses. Now you may think that using these fossil fuels is good, but it's actually killing our planet. Now, now that you know more about the problems, let's talk about the effects of sea level rise. For example, sea level rise is constantly rising. There, therefore, in 2100, Miami and other coastal places will be almost completely underwater. That will cause overcrowding and challenges for local government. Another example to the effects of sea level rise is a child born today could experience one to four feet of sea level rise. As this water is constantly rising, it could flood our city and ruin our land, which will cost a whole bunch of money to fix. Another thing that can affect us is when we farm and drink is when sea levels rise, when sea, level, wait. When sea levels rise, it mixes with our streams and rivers, which we use for drinking and farming. When the sea levels rise, the salt water goes deeper into our rivers and streams and makes it harder to access fresh water. These effects of sea level rise give us an understanding of how bad it is just because from burning fossil fuels, it's ruining our crops and drinking water. People are trying to find ways to stop sea level rise and keep our planet from flooding. To give you an example of what I mean is we can put plants on our roofs so it absorbs the carbon dioxide and releases more oxygen. This means that if we put plants on our roofs, since there's so many, it will absorb more carbon dioxide. Another example to a solution to sea level rise is we can start using solar power to power things instead of fossil fuels. Now I know we have at least one solar power company in Northport, so why don't we use it to make more solar panels to power our things? Because when we use fossil fuels, it's just releasing the carbon dioxide into our planet. Another way to stop sea level rise is we can reduce the amount of trees getting cut down. An example for this is Daniel Schaffer says, I'd stop deforestation and plant a ton of trees. It's not the quickest, but it's sustainable. Plus it Sir, you force. are out of time. Oh, I'm thank sorry. You for thank you very much. <laughs> I am Carrie Smith. Um, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners. I'm here to read my letter about Red Tide. So picture this. It's the start of summer, and you're heading to the beach for some fun. 
You draw closer and closer to the water and you start to notice an unfavorable smell. Then a moment later, a strong breeze blows your way, carrying a sulfurous scent of decay. Once you arrive, you see the shore, immersed in blood red waves. As you stare in terror, you look around for familiar sea animals, but you see that most of the wildlife nearby is deceased. Not only are your beach plans ruined, but you've witnessed the horror that is red tide. I'm asking you to take action to help prevent red tide. Red tide, one of the most common types being Carina brevis or K. brevis, is a form of toxic algal bloom in our waters. It typically spikes during August and December in Florida, and it makes our beaches really dirty and smell gross. Um, it is similar to a plant, so when there's extra minerals, it can get out of control if we don't do something about it. Um, something that typically causes red tide is um, extra minerals, as I said before, <coughs> and usually those extra minerals come from dead plants, which um, things like glyphosate, which the city of Northport uses to kill invasive or unwanted plants, typically fuel red tide and also cause those plants to decompose and become minerals for the red tide to use to flourish. Um, it hurts humans and living things. Um, for humans, it causes skin irritation, eye irritation, and lung problems. Um, it can trigger asthma, and um, it also has effects on protected and endangered animals like manatees because the red tide typically clouds out um, their seagrass, which causes them to starve. Um, one good method for preventing red tide while simultaneously getting rid of nuisance plants is hydro raking. Hydro raking can prove a safe method of removing plants, debris, and unwanted algae blooms. Hydro raking deposits around 500 pounds of unwanted material on shore per scoop. Um, and another effective method is adding more native plants and grasses in order to filter out those nutrients. I'm hoping you guys are able to provide these changes in order to prevent red tide. I'm Carrie Smith. Thank you for listening to my letter. The next three, Avery Bright, Macy Crawford, and Zariah Bonner. Hi, I'm Avery Bright, and I'm here to talk about sea level rise. Dear Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners of Northport, by 2100, Miami will be covered in ocean water. This isn't just a problem for South Florida, this is a problem for Northport too. In a small amount of time there will be flooding and it will be hard to access drinking water because of the salt water. I don't want this to happen and I'm sure you don't want this to happen either. Sea level rise is a serious problem, but if we work together we can help prevent it. Sea level rise is the rise of the ocean. For example, in 1800s, sea level rise wasn't even a thing, but in the past hundred years, the sea level has risen. Sea level rise is being caused by warming temperatures that are a result of human activity. Human activities like burning fossil fuels like gas and coal add carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide gets trapped there and heats the earth. With the average year-round year global warming temperatures rising, however, ice caps and glaciers are experiencing a disproportionate amount of melting at an accelerated rate. The melted ice flows into the ocean, causing higher sea level. This can let melted ice flow into the oceans in flood coastal areas like Northport. Sea level rise is caused primarily by two factors related to global warming. The added ice sheets and glaciers, and the primarily by an expansion of sea level as it warms. There isn't just 
the added sea, sea water from the ice and glaciers, but there's also the expansion of the water that was already there. What will happen to Northport if, if this keeps happening? Sea level rise is not just a minor problem. It can have a huge impact. By 2100, large swaths of coastal land in Florida will be permanently submerged. This isn't just for coastline. This is for Northport, too. This can affect the humans and animals living here. Soon the salt water will flow in to our important water sources. As the ocean rises, its, water, its salt water can mix with our rivers and groundwater, which is where many people get fresh water for drinking and farming. This is bad for the animals living in the fresh water and for us for drinking. Sea level rise is more of a problem than you may think. There are some ways for, for us to help prevent sea level rise. It won't decrease it, but can help stop it. One thing we can do in Northport is plant more trees and stop deforestation in Northport. Plants take up CO2 from the atmosphere and store that carbon in their trunks, stems, and leaves. So the more plants, the less CO2 to worry about. Trees act like filters and can take in the carbon dioxide in the air. That's why we need to plant more trees and stop cutting them down. They store carbon dioxide and cutting them down lets the CO2 into the atmosphere. Another solution is converting Northport to solar power. A simple approach to combating- Miss, your time is up. I'm sorry. Thank you okay. for your Thank comments. Thank you for listening to my letter. Hi, my name is Macy, and I'm here to address the problem of plastic pollution. Forget bottled water. Tap water is just as good. Pour it into a reusable water bottle and always have fresh water on the go without wasting plastic. Ashlyn Gores Cousteau. Why wait for plastic pollution to get worse when we can stop it now? Plastic pollution is starting to make our oceans unswimmable and is harmful for the sea life to live in. Plastic pollution is becoming a serious issue and we need to prevent it from ruining generations to come. Plastic pollution is excess of plastic due to its durability and the sheer amount produced can be found in the sea, on beaches and lakes and rivers. Plastic pollution also produces microplastics, which is really tiny particles that can't be seen with the human eye and comes from the breakdown of bigger plastic, which also harms the environment by causing harder ways to pick up the plastics. Nine billion tons of litter ends up in the ocean every year. People littering is causing plastic pollution to move up in rates and becoming harder to control. Some people litter and are not aware of the serious issue. When people cause plastic to take over our ocean, it affects our sea life and the oceans we swim in heavily. For example, 20% of plastic ocean trash enters the water directly. This debris includes fishing lines, nets, and items lost at sea, dumped overboard, or abandoned when they become damaged or no longer needed. This is upsetting how people have been purposely littering, which is creating garbage patches and affecting animals. For example, zooplankton that had swallowed polystyrene ate smaller bits of algae that cut their energy intake nearly in half. Plastic pollution ends up in only negative results and hurts harmless sea life. A solution to plastic pollution is spreading the word about it. For example, speak to local restaurants and businesses about options they can switch to for patch packaging, soaring, and bagging items. Many companies are starting to come up with excellent low-cost replacements, such as bamboo utensils in place of plastic ones. This is why I'm asking you to encourage restaurants and businesses in Northport to use sustainable items in replace of the use of plastic. A billboard is also a top recommendation for outdoor advertising because it consists of a large canvas or a panel where you can display huge images, fonts, or even videos of digi di digital billboards. This executes an eye-catching idea for people to help clean up plastic pollution when they see it. This is why I'm advising you to put up helpful information about plastic pollution to motivate the citizens in Northport to become aware of plastic, the harmful effects of it, and the harmful choices. I'm asking you to inform the people of Northport about plastic pollution. I know you care for Northport, and I do too. This is why I'm asking you to prioritize stopping plastic pollution and educating people to do so. We should all work together to stop plastic pollution and the horrible causes of it. Thank you for listening to my letter. Thank you. Hello, my name is Zariah Bohr, and I'm here to address the problem of plastic pollution. Have you ever wondered how much plastic is produced per year? To answer that question, 380 million metric tons. Think about how much is in our ocean. Five trillion pieces of plastic have been found in our ocean. Now think about how many animals have been killed because of this. Too many to count. 
The animals are being harmed and killed all because of this plastic. For example, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is almost twice the size of Texas. If you think about it, plastic doesn't just decay into nothing like other objects do. Plastic stays there for days, weeks, months, years, decades, centuries, and even into the thousands. Microplastics are an example. As a kid, I shouldn't have to worry about whether I am drinking or eating plastic. One of the major causes of plastic pollution is humans. What is plastic pollution? Plastic pollution is the act of littering disposable water bottles, plastic bags, food wrappers, and somehow blow into waterways that find their way into the ocean. Humans leave their trash around after eating and such, having it blow away into a waterway, bringing its way out into the ocean. The toothbrush you use in the morning? Plastic. The bags you bring your groceries home from? Plastic. The water bottle you bought from the store? Plastic. All these things that I'm listing are clearly plastic. And still all of them are in the ocean somewhere, just waiting for an animal to get stuck in or eat. How is it affecting the earth, or how is it putting the animals at risk? Not only is the plastic taking up our oceans with filth, but it is also killing the animals, harming them to the point where they cannot even swim. For example, these actions have horrible consequences for the animals, such as reduced mobility, starvation, drowning, or suffocation. It can lead to infections, growths, or amputation of limbs. It is affecting the earth rapidly, not being able to be stopped because of the amount that is being entered into our ocean. This isn't just in one place, it's everywhere. Florida is an example. Florida is a coastal area, which means there are more areas for the plastic to be accessed into the ocean. There are many solutions to this problem in Northport. Think about all the plastic bags that are used. When you buy groceries for your family and the plastic bags you bring them home in, those plastic bags are found all over the ocean. More than 500 billion plastic bags are used per year. Think about how many are in our ocean as we speak. Think about all of the animals that have gotten stuck in them. Ways to prevent the trash from getting into our waterways in Northport is a water goat. What is a water goat? A water goat is a floating surface net that collects trash as it drifts down a waterway. We could put these in so many of the waterways in Northport to prevent the trash from getting into our ocean. Another solution is banning plastic bags in the city of Northport. Instead, you could use a reusable bag. If that person would not like to bring a reusable bag, you can add an additional tax for the choice of a plastic bag. I've lived in Florida almost my entire life. I love going down to the beaches and spending time with my family to have fun and relax. I also love the animals in Florida. I have the thought of them, and they like to swim around in the ocean just until they run into a plastic bag and become harmed. They mistake it for their prey, such as turtles mistaking plastic bags for jellyfish. No, it won't fully disappear, but we can prevent from adding on to it. What can we do to stop this? Add recycling bins in parks instead. So I'm asking mayor, vice mayor, and commissioners help prevent this in Northport for the kids and future kids in the city of Northport. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my letter. The next three are Mark Dykenich, Abigail McDowell, and Daniel Reynas. Hello, my name is Mark Dinkanich, and I'm a student at Woodland Middle School, and my letter is about plastic pollution. Uh, imagine this, a large garbage vortex that spins in the ocean and collects ocean debris nonstop. It's called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is a collection of marine debris in the North Pacific Ocean, also known as the Pacific Trash Vortex. The garbage patch has two distant collections of debris bound by the massive North Pacific Subtropical Ocean. But that means that there are just spinning garbage piles in our ocean and we're just letting that happen. Plastic pollution is a major issue around the world and may affect Northport in many ways. Many different types of plastics are polluting the waterways and oceans. Plastics used in grocery bag stores and food packaging are also polluting the ocean. This means that the plastic bags and food packaging you and I use are ending up in the oceans and our waterways. People don't know that the Grocery bags, toys, and food packaging turns into tiny plastic beads from the different types of plastic that can be found in some toothpaste, facial scrubs, and one use for they wash down the drain to smell to be trapped in filters at wastewater treatment plants. This means that the toothpaste we use in facial scrubs wash down the drain going into wastewater, wastewater treatment plants being too small to be caught in filters, but then they end up in the North Port water so what happens to the plastic is a tragedy. We should stop the use of unnecessary plastic items because it destroys our waterways and harms the environment. For example, in the ocean, plastic breaks down when exposed to the sun's UV rays. Those UV rays break down the strong chemical bonds within the plastic. This means that when the plastic is in the ocean, the sun's UV rays break down the plastic 
pieces into smaller and smaller until they become so small they make their ways into living organisms. Whether a tiny plankton or enormous whale, it may spell some real trouble. This means that those little plastic pieces that are floating around is making its way into our fish that we eat as sushi or other ways. A solution to this problem is trash traps in the litter booms. It can snag garbage before it enters waterways. That's just saying a little garbage trap could stop, uh, stop or catch garbage before entering the waterways of North Park. Stopping the use of Stopping the use of foam containers is another solution. These break up quickly and are not recyclable. That means foam containers that the people in Northport and you and I use are not recyclable and end up in the waterways of Northport. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioner, I know you love Northport and the kids of North North. I know you love Northport and the kids of Northport as much as the most of us. I enjoy the water in places in Northport, so I ask you to help keep the waterways of Northport parks. Staying clean by installing litter booms and trash trap with water goats. You can save the North Port and its beauty for future kids. Sincerely, Mark Dankanich, Woodland Middle School. Thank you for listening to my letter. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Abigail McDowell, and I'd like to present to you my concerns with glyphosate. Dear Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners, Glyphosate has impacted freshwater sources and entire ecosystems by making it vulnerable to the effects of pollution and global warming. McGill <coughs> University has done studies on how glyphosate has hurt animals and the oceans. These studies state, on first exposure to glyphosate, zooplankton community and diversity declined rapidly. The long-lasting impacts of glyphosate on these freshwater communities need to be investigated fast. The long-lasting impacts of glyphosate on these freshwater communities are very troubling. If less diverse freshwater communities are heavily affected, a lot of fish are going to die. Glyphosate research has only skimmed the surface of this massively growing problem, and that is why we need to stop the usage of this product before it's too late. The use of glyphosate products is worldwide, and Northport isn't excluded. Glyphosate is the known most heavily as Roundup. Glyphosate is being used commonly and conveniently in gardens, ditches, farms, and other agricultural areas to get rid of unwanted plants. Glyphosate is infecting the waters and contaminating it with chemicals that aren't suitable for the human body. Glyphosate is generally used in agricultural operations as well as in forestry work, in aquatic settings, and on home lawns and gardens. Glyphosate can be used anywhere and everywhere. Glyphosate is easy to use and that means it can be easily spread. Glyphosate is damaging and infiltrating water sources and believe it or not, animals. If this herbicide isn't stopped soon, it's, going, it's only going to get worse. Glyphosate is harmful, and here's why. Outbreaks of several animal and plant diseases have been related to glyphosate accumulation in the environment. And Roundup is the real cause of CCD in honeybees. Scientists have been studying the effects of Roundup on honeybees for 20 years. It makes the feud forest, those adult bees that are collecting the nectar and pollen, so sick that they do not return to the hive. This just shows that glyphosate and other harmful herbicides can cause plants and animals to contract diseases and even die from this vicious chemical. Just like how so many of those bees died over this issue. Bees were suffering from the flowers that are supposed to nurture them. Herbicides like glyphosate that are getting into our water can impact us and the ecosystem around it. A groundskeeper of a school near San Francisco proved that he contracted terminal cancer through repeated exposure to glyphosate. Glyphosate can cause serious malfunctions in the human body. Illnesses such as lymphoma and cancer aren't things to take lightly. This chemical is damaging people's ways of life and hurting the animals that have done nothing to deserve the illnesses they are being faced with. There are surprisingly simple ways to rectify these harmful actions. Several other non-selective herbicides are available for landscape plantings. These, harm, these less harmful herbicides are like diquat, polargonic acid, and glufosinate are able to be used. If we stop using this product, it can help all those animals. Our world is changing, and we must change with it to ensure the safety yes. of our freshwater resources are, and yeah, animals. I'm sorry, you're out of time. Thank you very much. I just much. finished. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to my letter. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings. My name is Daniel Reynas. Um, <clears throat> Dear Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners, 
I, I love North Parts. I know it has so many great memories to me and my family members. And I know you have some great memories too. Do we all want our children and our relatives to have the same good memories of our town? But the threat of sea le level rise is looming. And that's why we should switch from burning fossil fuels and cutting down trees to solar power and more trees being planted. Burning fossil fuels can make sea level rise and mix with our drinking water and increase CO2 in our air. Sea level rise definition is a drastic rise in the amount of water in the ocean and a complex issue with many causes. Burning fossil fuels is the burning of oil, natural gas, and coal to generate energy. This, in short, means that people are taking non-renewable resources and burning them to create energy while releasing large amounts of CO2 in the air. People also want to start deforestation in our area. Deforestation is the... <clears throat> The purposeful clearing of forested land. This means that people are cutting down areas that have a great deal of trees in them. This is bad because trees hold in our carbon. Car America's forests sequester over 800 million tons of carbon each year. This means that people are removing enormous areas of forested land and also want to and cut them down while producing CO2 in the act of deforestation. We should stop increasing the amount of CO2 in our air because it is drastically increasing sea level. A child born today can expect the, this, the ocean to rise between one and four feet in their lifetime. In our lifetime, the water could rise and flood our homes and make some places uninhabitable. Additionally, Sea level, rising sea levels water can mix with our river and groundwater, which is where many people get drink, fresh water for drinking and farming. People would get sick from drinking our flooded canals and crops that feed our people would fail. And the, the threat that is sea level rise can contaminate our canals, and give, which give us fresh water for drinking and farming. It can make land previously inhabitable uninhabitable. This is why I'm asking you to make renewable energy a larger part of Northport. It is a, a safe and good solution to sea level rise. This solar power is a much more optimal resource than fossil fuels. This means that solar power is a more useful and better energy than that of fossil, fossil fuels. So solar power can also provide lots of jobs, boosting our city's money. The transition to renewables is boosting employment opportunities in the, in the U.S., a new report finds. Uh, th that means that more people can get more jobs and get rich to afford homes and such. Additionally, another solution is to plant more trees. For example, plants take up CO2 from the atmosphere and store that carbon in their trunks, stems, and leaves, so the more plants, the less CO2 to worry about. This means that they're... they're <clears throat> this means that, there, that if there are lots of trees, those trees take the carbon dioxide and release oxygen while holding in the carbon. These solutions help stop the threat that is rising sea levels in our area. We don't need coal or oil. We need solar power. Thank you so much for reading my letter. <laughs> Have a good day. The last one is Valdi Oliander. As Valdi is coming up, I, I just want to thank the students who made comments tonight. It is so clear to me that a lot of work went into that, and I learned a lot. So thank you very much. Sure, go right ahead, Commissioner. Yeah, I, I tell you what, thank you so very much. These presentations were so professional, and, and the research was phenomenal. I mean, we learned so much. You came up with a problem and a solution. That's very rare when we're sitting up here. We normally hear the problems, and that's it. <laughs> uh, but you all did a fantastic job. Your presentations, nobody seemed like they were nervous out there whatsoever. <laughs> and you got some proud parents and siblings out there for sure. And I know you have a proud teacher. But one, Miss Macy, I see you as a motivational speaker in your future. <laughs> That's for sure. So very good. Very good. Commissioner McDowell. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. And Mr. Valdi, I appreciate your patience while we address. It's not very often, as go you ahead, know. We get students that come here with <laughs> your passion and your desire to make these problems and issues known. Um, the city of Northport hears these and are doing our very best to, to solve and take heed to what your concerns are. And you just being here today, addressing your 
public officials, that's huge. So many adults don't take the time to do that. Yes, I know this is a school assignment, but I have a feeling you might have something more in your future. And you should be very, very proud of yourselves. You spoke with, with authority, you knew the subject, and like Commissioner Emmerich said, not only did you pose the problem, you gave us a solution. That is usually missing in the other side when public commenters come up and speak. You are to be commended, great job. Parents, you should be commended too. And your teacher, very good job in preparing them for this. Awesome, awesome, <coughs> awesome. Commissioner Stokes. I'll be very brief. Don't lose your passion. There you yeah. go. <laughs> Great job for all you who spoke. Don't lose your passion. Vice Mayor White. Yes. The instigator. Yes, the instigator. I am guilty, yes. But I'm so, <laughs> so happy to see all of you here. And I have to tell you, I, I can remember when I was in middle school, I never would have had the nerve to get up in front of a public meeting and do what you did. So you, you need to understand and know what a great thing you did and echoing Commissioner Stokes, the passion you showed is, is really what makes it, makes what you're saying heard and, and understood. It's because you're passionate about, about what you were speaking of. So thank you again for coming out. Thank the parents for, for taking the time to bring your children here and, uh, and listening to all of them. And all, also, this is probably maybe some of your first experience being in a uh, city chambers and to see how the decorum is and how all of you were such good listeners. I'm really proud of that, that you were listening to each other too. So thank you so much. And thank you again for your patience, Mr. Allender. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, so it seems like there's a big task in front of you. I am uh, also read some history, and if I am not mistaken, Ponce de Leon observed red tide way, way, way back. Okay, I am from the Olander, North Port Florida, geographical area. I come here in peace and I have a dignity. Please respect it. I am not a criminal and please don't treat me like one. I have no contract with North Port Corporation, so you bylaws does not apply to me. And I will using the language from the Florida Constitution, right to instruct their representatives. So, Lagdon, I am uh, in, uh, instructing you to remove Mr. Cook from my bag. He can sit over here. Like I said, I'm not a criminal, and you know that. Uh, and, I'm, and please don't treat me like Dred Scott of 1857. And stop the intimidation. Um, if you don't uh, obey, you in the contempt of your oath, which is your duty. You breach your duty, breaching your duty qualified as the visceral hatred. Let's change the subject. Under duties of the manager in city charter, I can find as his duty to propose an agenda. Check it, because you are duly qualified. That's what you said. Correct me if I'm wrong. So under power vested in me, preamble to the city charter, I demand to any item on the agenda over here, you must show authority. Authority, who brings this item to agenda? Authority, this, it is in the city charter, Constitution of Florida, Constitution of the United States, all else, all else. And why are you voting first the agenda? Do you legalize lawlessness? In Florida, uh, keep, keep on the manager. Manager's duty is to attend all city meetings, either in person or by duly qualified and designated representative with a voice. So either him or somebody else, but never both. In Florida Constitution, Article 8 states, Officers to continue in the office. Question, can there be an officer without the office? You can check the charter. It explains you very well. And I respect those people, so I will not object three minutes 
requirement in the lack of requirement Thank you, in the sir, Constitution. Thank for your you. comments. City Clerk, you said that was our last public comment yes. for this section. Thank you very much. Let's move on to announcements. Item number 23-0158, current vacancies and upcoming expirations for advisory boards and committees. Um, City Clerk, would you read the announcements, please? Current vacancies and upcoming expirations for boards and committees. The current vacancies for the following boards and committees include Art Advisory Board, Audit Committee, Charter Review Advisory Board, Citizens Tax Oversight Committee, Community Economic Development Advisory Board, Environmental Advisory Board, Police Officers Pension Trust Fund Board of Trustees, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, Veterans Park Advisory Committee, and Zoning Board of Appeals. Upcoming expirations for the following boards and committees. Charter Review Advisory Board, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Citizen Tax Oversight Committee, Environmental Advisory Board, Veterans, Veterans Park Advisory Committee, and Veterans Park, that's on there twice, just once. Sarasota County Advisory Council vacancies, one resident of Northport to serve on the Bicycle, Pedestrian, Trail Advisory Committee. One resident of Northport to serve on the Citizens Oversight Committee for School Facility Planning. And one resident of Northport to serve on the Parks Advisory and Recreation Council. If anyone would like more information, please see the City Clerk's office. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk. On to the consent agenda. City Manager, have any items been pulled from the consent agenda for discussion? Yes, ma'am. We have a few. Item A, 23-0514. Item C is a cat, 23-0532. Item D, 23-0533. And item G, 23-0563. Thank you, City Manager. I'm looking for a motion. I'll make a motion. Thank you, Commissioner. I'll make a motion, Mayor, to approve the consent agenda as presented, pulling items A, C like Charlie, D like David, and G like gold. We have a motion on the floor to approve the consent agenda, pulling numbers A, C, D, and G. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Motion maker, Commissioner McDowell, seconder, Vice Mayor White. City manager, who pulled item A? Uh, Commissioner McDowell. Commissioner? Mayor, we need the vote. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm way ahead of myself. Let's vote, please. And that item passes 5 to 0. Commissioner McDowell, you pulled item A? Yes, Mayor. And if I could, I can combine for, for time sen the sensitivity, we can combine A, C, and D as to one item because they are all related. The reason why I pulled these items is because if we approve them at the $1,000 request for each, that will leave us a balance of $623 for the next six months of the year or until the uh, event actually takes place, which is in June, a few months from now. If we approve the estimated city expenses, that will leave us over $2,000 in the fund for the community specialist event assistance program. I'm afraid by approving it at $1,000 each, we get others that come in here they may not get any money because the money will be used up until the events are held. So um, that's why I pulled these items for discussion and just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention. If there's no further discussion, Mayor, I'll go ahead and make a motion. I'm not seeing any discussion, go ahead. Mayor, I'll make a motion to approve the award of special event assistance for the Caribbean American Cultural Connections, the Kiwanis event for the Women's Safety Program, and the Kiwanis event for the Pex Pet Expo <coughs> at the actual city expense threshold for each one of those events. We have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner McDowell 
to um, reflect the actual requested amount for uh, event items A, C, and D? No, ma'am. They're requesting $1,000. I am. I am I'm, not, I'm not reading it that no, way. No. That City way. manager, would you it clarify, is, please? It says up to it's not to exceed dollars. Or, yeah, not to exceed not to exceed a thousand dollars. Meaning they will be paid back for the actual cost that they are reimbursable for up to that amount. And yes, some of those amounts listed, as Commissioner McDowell is saying, is underneath the thousand dollar threshold. So it's not an actual amount they were asking for of a thousand dollars. I think we have a, a director up here to Sandy Fun Hiller, Parks and Recreation Director. Um, they are eligible for up to one thousand mm -hmm. dollars based on the way the program is stated right now. That's why we submit it that way. There could be additional costs that happen um, if they need to extend their time. Their time goes over for their actual event, or if they need additional resources, um, they realize they need them before the event, and we're able to accommodate them. So that's mm -hmm. why we asked for the up to that amount. How often does that happen? On occasion. Mm -hmm. One in five, one in. Yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's a couple times a year when uh, their event will go over the time uh, or they'll need to come in and set up earlier. Um, so we charge them for that rental time. Um, and then that, if they have that award available, it can cover that cost. Thank you. Commissioner Emmerich? Yeah, but wouldn't that be the actual cost? from the city that they would be reimbursed regardless up to a thousand dollars. It's not to exceed a thousand dollars. If the cost was eight hundred, they would get eight hundred. Correct. You know, even if they had overtime or whatever the case may Correct. be, they would be reimbursable for that. So even by stating it as actual city costs, it's the same thing. No. If, no? if you award actual city costs, it's it's what I have on that sheet right now is their mm -hmm. estimated cost. Um, and that could change before the event because because we're so far in advance of in, in advance of the event there could be something else that comes up um, they want more garbage totes or recycling or um, they need more time to set up and so they rent additional time no I understand that but we're not to exceed a thousand bucks what what Correct. are the proposals right now the thousand dollar award for each of them is what they're eligible for up to that amount but what are the costs projected at right now, then? So the Caribbean American Cultural Connections um, currently is uh, $755. Uh, the Kiwanis Club for the Women's Health Expo is $297.50. And then um, the Qantas Club for the Pet Expo is four hundred and thirty dollars. Okay, so if we approved whatever the city costs are, they could fluctuate, but they would still be under a thousand dollars. They'll be under a thousand dollars. That's why I'm saying I don't see a difference in the way that we're wording these motions. I, I just don't understand. Okay, um, I believe the way that uh, Commissioner McDowell asked you to word it was to only award them what is listed on that Thank sheet you. as the. Mm -hmm. 400 and some dollars or the 700 and some dollars that would not allow them should they have additional costs before the event to get reimbursed for those if they're from that amount up to the 1000 they're eligible for it would not allow that okay well i understand it now but then we're going to be sort of handcuffing these individuals if they are entitled up to a thousand and if that's policy that's what we should be following correct in my opinion. That's all I had that there. Is Thank, you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Vice Mayor? Yes, I just want to clarify. These are city costs only. Correct. So yes. if there's rentals for, from private places, this does not cover that. It does not. So it would only be if the city costs happen to go up. Um, and and this rental, these rentals cover like if they're using, well, obviously the Pet Expo is for the use of the Mullen Center. So it's whatever the, we're charging. The rented space, the recycling totes, the garbage. Yes. Right. Right. Um, yeah, and I, I, I think it's great that people want to come and do things in the city. And uh, again, we're only talking about our own expenses because that's the partnership here that these groups are coming in to, to put on something for the people and uh, just not having to bear the full burden of everything the city costs because they're still paying for other things that the city's not going to, to cover. So, um, you know, I understand this completely. 
Um, I have a, a quick question. So if we wanted to increase the amount of money in this fund, we could do a budget amendment that would come before this board, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Commissioner McDowell? But to, and to your point, Mayor, because I thought of the same thing, if we do a budget amendment to increase the amount from 5,000 that is currently budgeted to a different amount, that's going to take time mm -hmm. to prepare. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. if we approve it at the amount they're requesting of $1,000 for each event, there will be only $623 left in the fund until one or two things happen. We make that amendment if it passes, and two, the event actually takes place. So if another nonprofit wants to come forward between now and June, the end of June, there would be no money for it. They could come forward and ask for an amendment to the amount once the event is over, couldn't they? It, they would not be coming to you. It would be staff coming to you with another agenda item. Yeah, I, I just, if we- Commissioner, I'm, I'm itching for a motion on this. I think you're revving up to one, aren't you? No, ma'am, I'm not. I'm trying to trying to have a dialogue with my commissioners on a subject that's before us. And I, I want to make sure because I don't think you guys are understanding what I'm trying to do here. I'm not trying to say, no, we're not going to have the special event assistance program be utilized. I am asking to make sure that we have enough funds in place for future events that may come forward. And the way to resolve that is to reduce the amount to what the city estimated the expenses to be. And if you look at the overview sheet, not once has the estimated expenses fell higher than what was eligible, and they were all lower than what was originally estimated. I'm not seeing any other comments from my fellow commissioners. I'll make a motion, Mayor. Go ahead, Commissioner. I'll make a motion to approve the Caribbean American Heritage Month celebration at the amount of $755. The, I'm sorry, at the amount of $855, the Kiwanis Pet Expo at $300. Commissioner McDowell, you have to do them separately because they're three agen different agenda items. Oh. I thought I could combine them. No, I you can combine the discussion, just not the vote. Okay, yes. I apologize. Thank you for that. I'll make a motion to approve the Caribbean American Heritage Month celebration in the amount of $855. I have a motion on the floor to approve the award of funds for the Caribbean American Cultural Connections in the amount of $855. Motion made by Commissioner McDowell. Do I hear a second? And that motion fails for lack of a second. And just for the clarity, they were asking for $755. I made it $100 more to cover any additional expenses. Mayor, I, I, I'm not going to make any further motions. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner. City Clerk, can we just leave those other two items on the floor? You have to make a motion to approve them if you want them approved. Can, <laughs> okay. can we? If, can we just leave can I, that? Can I make a motion and see if it flies to okay, approve items? Do. You need to move to the item. Okay, so, exactly. Mayor, you need to state you've moved on to the next item. Okay, we'll and move on to item to number twenty-three dash zero five three two. Commissioner Emmerich, did you want to make a motion on we that didn't, item? We didn't settle anything on the first one. There was no motion. I know it failed, but what I'm looking at is. We have A, C, and D. Yes. Can I make a motion to approve A, C, and D as presented? No, you can make a motion to approve A. Okay. And then we'll move on to the I'm next one. I'm going to make an motion. a motion to approve item A in the consent agenda 23-0514. I have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner Emmerich to approve item number 23-0514 as presented. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor... White, anything to that? No. Let's vote, please.
And that motion passes five to zero. Moving on to item number 23-0532. I'll make, make a motion to approve item number 23-532 as presented. Do I have a second? I'll second. We have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner Emmerich to approve item number 23-0532 as presented. Seconded by Vice Mayor White. Anything to that? No. Let's vote. May I speak to it? Uh, go ahead, Commissioner. I just want to make sure that everybody understands the reason why I'm voting for this is because, yes, these are events that happen in our city. I just don't agree with the amount because it's going to short our account. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and that motion passes 5 to 0. Moving on to 23-0533. Do I have a motion? You're on the I'll make a motion to approve item number 23-5. Three, three, as presented. Second. I have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner Emmerich, seconded by Vice Mayor White, to approve item number 23-0533 as presented. Sorry. Commissioner Stokes, and no, I sorry. have you, Commissioner McDowell. I voted, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. And that motion passes 5-2-0. And Mayor, if I may, the reason I proposed it that way is because if it is not used, it falls back into the kitty. Regardless, right. it may be handcuffed for a moment, but when it's not used, it goes right back into the kitty. Why have them come back and forth to us to try and adjust the amounts? So right. it's there. It's what they're entitled to, and it's policy. So yeah, that's the reason. You. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Thank you, Mayor. So we're moving on to public hearings first. No, no we we still got number G, yeah, ma'am. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. The reason Boy. I pulled this, Mayor, is because when I initially requested to do conflict resolution between me and the city manager, I requested to use my own training budget to fulfill that expense. The city manager declined the invitation to do the conflict resolution and then propose that it be done with all five of us, him and the other two charter officers. With that proposal, I do not believe that it should come solely out of the commissioner's contingency fund. I believe it should be split 50-50 between the commission's contingency fund and the city manager's contingency fund. If there's no further discussion, I'll be happy to make a motion to that effect. Let's give it a minute. No problem. I, I think, think uh, Vice Mayor White is trying, trying to get her button. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. Um, I, I don't have a problem with the way it's, it's written now. I think it's okay. That's Anyone it. else care to yeah, weigh in? Go ahead. Yeah, Michelle. when did we decide to have this as a whole, City Manager? When did we decide to have it as a whole group? Yeah, a whole group with the conflict. Oh, December, December 13th, 2022. Because I thought it was still separate. Okay. Yeah, I got no issues with it coming out of whatever budget it needs to come out of. It just needs to happen then. And, and I think we have broadened the proposal a little bit to cover communication issues and some other things. And so I, I like the approach of us doing it as a group. I think we can all improve in that area. Anything else on this item? Does anyone feel so moved to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Go ahead, Commissioner McDowell. I'll make a motion to approve the agreement for the conflict resolution using 50% from the commission's contingency fund and 50% from the city manager's contingency fund. I have a motion on the floor to approve the agreement. Uh, between Florida Gulf Coast University Board of Trustees and the city, funding at 50-50 from the commissioner's um, fund and the city manager's contingency fund. Commission Maker, is Commissioner McDowell, do I have a second? I'm not hearing a second, so that motion fails for lack of a second. Does anyone else want to make a motion on this item? I'll make a motion. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. I make a motion uh, to 
for item 23-0563 to approve the agreement between Florida Gulf Coast University Board of Trustees and City of Northport for training of constructive communication for the commission and charter officers and authorize the use of funds from the commission contingency account for said training. We have a motion on the floor made by Vice Mayor White to approve the agreement between Gulf Coast University Board of Directors, City Clerk. Do you have the rest of that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Is there anything else to that? Let's vote, please. And that motion passes four to one. The reason I dissented is the reason of okay, the funding. Yep. Moving on to public hearings, petition um, A, DMA-21-269. This is a quasi-judicial hearing. City Clerk, would you read the petition by title and swear in those willing to provide testimony? DMA-21-269, consideration of petition number DMA 21-269 Suncoast Technical College Commercial Out Parcels Development Master Plan Amendment. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge to help you God? Do. Thank you. Do we have any ex parte communications on the part of my fellow commissioners, Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. Vice Mayor Wyatt? I just had some questions during my agenda briefing about uh, the traffic light. Thank you for that. I don't have any. Commissioner Stokes? No, ma'am. Commissioner McDowell? Yes, ma'am. I requested a copy of the traffic impact <clears throat> report, which I received, and I sent the email request to the city clerk for the record. Thank you. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any aggrieved parties on this matter? We do not. Okay, it's time for presentations. Applicant, you have 20 minutes. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Mike Pinnell from Stonefield Engineering, 400 North Ashley Drive, Suite 1950, Tampa, Florida. Here on behalf of the applicant, Toledo Blade Partners. Uh, the application in front of you tonight is for a development master plan amendment. I've been working on this for a couple years with city staff, going back and forth, trying to come through with the right, the right ideas, right lot, lot spacing, and also the improvements that are needed within the right of ways. The existing development master plan for the Suncoast Technical College out parcels consists of the technical college, the library, five approximately evenly sized commercial outlots, a stormwater management system along the interstate, and then roadways and roadway infrastructure, including utilities and stormwater to get to the back stormwater management facility. The development master plan approved in 2015, was approved in 2015 and we're looking to amend it, really looking at just the commercial outlots themselves and we will not be touching the technical college, the library, the roadway itself, career lane, and then the infrastructure in there as well, the sidewalks, the utilities. Um, just for reference for the commercial lots, they are split into five lots. The lot one is located at the south ends, which is at the intersection of Toledo Blade and, and Cranberry, going numerically up towards the interstate with lot five being next to the stormwater management system. The development master plan amendment request really can be split into three different parts. The first is the reconfiguration of the lots, which consists of, which also includes the relocation of lot one's driveway onto Career Lane, and also the relocation of all access drainage and utility easements that go along with the current lot configuration. The second request is for the Toledo Blade right-of-way improvements, and this includes a right-in only driveway from Toledo Blade and a proposed eight-foot sidewalk that will connect the existing sidewalk at the intersection of Cranberry and Toledo all the way up to the existing sidewalk 
at the off ramp of I-75. And that came from, directly from a staff request. The third request is the Cranberry Road improvements. This would include your lane widening, the traffic signal installation at Career and Cranberry, and then all related stormwater improvements for the additional impervious area. So the five existing lots are approximately all evenly sized around 80,000 square feet. Our proposed application would increase the lot areas of lot one and lot four, reduce the lot areas of two and three, and have a very minimal impact to lot five. It moves about 40 square feet, 20 square feet additional of additional square footage. As part of the lot configuration, we'll be moving the existing curb cut into lot one, north, farther away from the intersection of Career and Cranberry. Additionally, all easements would be moved as necessary to include that, that access point and then also the new uh, lot configuration. A second access would be provided to lot one as part of the Tlan, as part of the Toledo Blade right, right of way improvements. We'd be adding in a right turn only into the site to capture southbound traffic on Toledo Blade. So they don't have to go around on the Cranberry, on a career, and then into, into the career, into the commercial outlots themselves. The two lots, the two lot one access points are gonna be offset so you don't have through traffic speeding from one from one to the other to cut around the traffic's the traffic signals. Um, all Toledo Blade right away ingress movements, all the infrastructure has been worked out with city staff and also FDOT because we are right at the FDOT jurisdiction line. Mm -hmm. And it does include an extension of the right turn lane that is out there today. The Cranberry Boulevard roadway improvements. So these really came as part of when we came to do our DMA, the city, city staff asked us to relook at the traffic that was being impacted because some time had passed since this originally was approved in 2015. And because the city of Northport has grown and the surrounding areas have also experienced a good uptick in population, the improvements along Cranberry Road did need to be widened, did need to see some changes to the way the road out there was laid out. So we did a traffic impact study. We prepared it, provided it to city staff and it was approved. And it lays out roadway improvements that would be installed as different markers are met. So as more traffic, more the as the as the lots are developed, those different items would be brought in. And we we provided all of our improvements based on highest and best use, which is the standard of F dot and all and, and all the state of Florida. So looking here, we have, if you look from these on the left side, we have the intersection of Cranberry and Toledo Blade. The roadway improvements include a lane widening. So this would be five lanes. You'd have two dedicated eastbound, two dedicated westbound. And then you'd have a center lane that would switch, that would be utilized for left turn lanes, that would switch from going eastbound to westbound as you came up to different intersections. It, would be, it wouldn't be a two-way left, it would just, the, the striping would change, so there's left hand turn storage for both intersections. At full capacity, there is expected to be a, there is going to be a traffic signal at Career and Cranberry, and this is because we do not meet the requirements as far as FDOT requirements to put that in place prior to that point. So at full operation, we do, there is going to be a, a traffic signal, but it will not be installed immediately. The remainder of the improvements along Cranberry Boulevard have to do with the existing drainage. Uh, currently, all the drainage is handled in roadside drainage ditches, and it all goes to this pond that's located at the southwest corner of Cranberry Beach and Commerce. We are working with city stormwater staff to revise and make sure that we're not making any of the stormwater worse. We're going to make it all better. We're going to make it better than it is today, 
or at least to existing existing uh, requirements, as is the requirement of all state and local local standards. We are working directly with city staff at their request on that. Our team has had a chance to review the staff report, and we are in agreement that the proposed amendment does meet the requirements of of the future land use code and the land and the, the master plan and the development code. I appreciate the time tonight. Thank you, sir. Staff, you're up. Good evening, commissioners. For the record, Sherry Willette Grandin, Planning and Zoning Division. I have been sworn. The petition before you today for consideration is petition number DMA 21 269. It is amendments to the Suncoast Technical College commercial out parcel. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see an aerial of the project site. The applicant is James Angelini, managing member of Toledo Blade Partners, LLC. The property owner is Toledo Blade Partners, LLC. As stated previously, the request is a development master plan amendment. The components of this request is to reconfigure lot sizes, easements, and roadway improvements on Toledo Blade and Cranberry Boulevard for the Technical College commercial out parcels. The location is west of and adjacent to North uh, Toledo Blade Boulevard and north of and adjacent to North Cranberry Boulevard. <laughs> A little bit of history, as you can see from the right hand of the screen, this is the original development master plan that was approved by commission in 2015. And this uh, development master plan included the Suncoast Technical College Library, the commercial out parcels, as well as um, stormwater and related uh, items to the site. The amendments for this only applies to those five out parcels. It's to reconfigure the lot sizes easements, including the cross access easements. All of the size or the potential size of the lots do meet the code requirements. Um, there's adding in a right drive, uh, right in driveway from Toledo Blade southbound and the traffic signal at the intersection of Career Lane and Cranberry Boulevard. Here is an overview of the overall development master plan. You can see the configuration of the lots and the five lots are out in the front adjacent to Toledo Blade. The applicant is not requesting any modifications or waivers as part of the development master plan amendment. And the previously approved AMP 1524 did not have any waivers. It was approved without waivers. A neighborhood meeting was conducted at the time uh, for the project in February 15, 2015, under the approved development master plan. That neighborhood meeting included the out parcels, as well as the technical college and the library. Staff uh, has reviewed, staff development team has reviewed the project. There has been no objections and where it meets requirements with conditions. A lot of the conditions are at the time of the site development stage, with the exception of public works stormwater. Comprehensive plan data and analysis. Staff has reviewed the proposed development master plan for consistency with the city's comprehensive plan and the unified land development code. Policy 2.1.4.1 1. AC4 I-75 Toledo Blade Boulevard. Panacea. This activity center is established to provide a large concentrated area of a mixture of residential, commercial office, medical, industrial, recreation, and cultural facilities at a scale which serves the entire city and the regional market. So the existing library and uh, technical college, as well as these art po uh, out parcels do meet the intent and is consistent with this policy. Comprehensive Plan Chapter 3, Transportation Element, Goals, Objectives, and Policies, states the city as needed will conduct studies to identify needed signalization or signage improvements, turn lanes, traffic calming, connectivity, 
crosswalk controls at warranted in, uh, intersections. The cost of these improvements may be shared between the city and the Florida Department of Transportation or other appropriate agencies. There is a question there uh, within the um, for developer agreement to share 50-50 of the cost of installing the traffic signal and widening a portion of Cranberry Boulevard. Uh, staff was concluding this proposed development is consistent with this policy. Unified land development code analysis. The zoning is commercial general. Commercial general district is intended to provide areas which uh, there are customary and traditional conduct of trade, retail, sales, and commerce. And without the disruption by the encroachment and intrusion of incompatible residential uses and protection from the adverse effects of undesired industrial uses, staff concludes that the proposed development master plan is consistent with this section. A fiscal impact analysis was performed as part of the development master plan review in 2015. The project assumptions projected an output from the tire development area at the time of $43,098,331 for the first five years and $86,740,409 after build out and indirect input from the development at $22,226,393 plus approximately additional 506 to 1,006 employees. The, um, the next steps, if this is approved, would be actually going for the uh, revision to the subdivision infrastructure plan, a replat that would come before this commission for approval. And um, it would be individual major site and development petitions for each. The Planning and Zoning Advisory Board has reviewed this petition March 2nd, 2023, and has approved it by unanimous vote. Um, a developer's agreement for the traffic impact mitigation and cost sharing of the Cranberry Boulevard career lane intersection signalization and the Cranberry Boulevard road work will be required within 180 days of the development master plan approval. That is um, staff's recommended condition number one. The second condition number two is uh, from stormwater that at the time detailed stormwater des system design treatment and attenuation analysis for the additional roadway impervious areas will need to be addressed in the future site development applications, which would be the major site and development plans, and any needed drainage easements must be provided. Um, we do have staff from our public works department to answer any question concerning the traffic signal improvements, any mitigations or impacts. And um, staff, thank you. Thank you, we staff. We are available. Applicant, do you have any rebuttal? No, thank you. Staff, any rebuttal? Staff has no rebuttal, thank you. City Clerk, do we have any online or in-person public commenters? No. Okay, then let's move on. I'm opening the floor to commission questions. I'm trying. Yeah. Commissioner Stokes. All right, um, question for staff. Um, first, if you can go back to the, uh, if staff could go back to the slide or to the page that shows the financial impact. I just had a question. Yeah, of the, uh, when we talk about the entire development area, 43 million and uh, for the first five years, 86 million, how it, it, pr how much is projected of that number to be applicable to the five parcels? How much is already there? So at the time the fiscal impact analysis was done back in 2015, it was based on the overall project site. There wasn't a breakdown of you know what was allocated per the uh, commercial out parcels at that time. So there's no so way to know what contribution that those five parcels are really making. 
Um, not at this time, based on these figures. This was based on the um, approved original development master plan in 2015. And here is just the, the amendments to those out parcels. Uh, second question I have is, as you come off of 75 onto Toledo Blade, is it envisioned that that right, that right lane is going to enter right into parcel one, or is there going to be a additional lane that people will move into so that they don't, they aren't turning right off of the right hand lane that exists today? I just couldn't yes. tell from. Of course, um, Mr. Stokes, I do have um, the Public Works Department to answer the questions or the applicant can answer the question, whichever commission prefers. The applicant's fine. Yeah. So the existing right turn lane for <clears throat> Toledo and Cranberry, that's going to be extended. And that right turn, you will enter into, the, into lot one directly from that right turn lane. So it won't be, will it be widened any or no? We'll just turn keeping in. Keeping the same width, but you're lengthening it. So you're moving it towards this interstate. And when is, you might be able to answer this question as well. What is the projected time frame of installing the light at Cranberry and Toledo in relation to building out these five parcels? Is it going to be, is that, will that light be there before these parcels are fully developed and sold or rented or whatever they may be? The lighting, Cranberry and Career. Correct. It will not be installed before mm -hmm. the development of those because we do not meet the traffic warrants for lighting. Obviously, I haven't driven Toledo Blade. <laughs> I, I do not make the traffic warrants. Right? Vice Mayor White. Um, yes, uh, first a question about that traffic light while we're on the subject. Um, is that cost sharing, right? Is that 50-50? Do I have that right, my notes? Right. And, that, and if so, that's the other 50% is the city? For the record, Anthony Friedman, um, Public Works Engineering, have been sworn. Yes, the cost sharing is 50-50. We're planning to have 50% of it paid by the developer and 50% of it paid by the city through impact fees. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me of that. All right. I had another question about um, the, the trees being removed. And this was the DMP that was approved in 2015. So is it that ordinance that was in place in 2015 that's applying to this amendment? Um. So when the when it was built in 2015, that applied. So we have the new amendment. So the current code will apply. Oh, the current yes. code. That is so correct. there will be mitigation. There'll be tree yes. survey mitigation. Yes, everything. Yes, uh, everything will be based on the current As of code now. regulations. Okay. And then I, um, I you know really tried to, to to look at this. This is really different. I made a note to myself to bring a magnifying glass. Okay, because <laughs> it's really. Even when you try to blow it up, everything becomes blurry to see that. But those are all trees that are going to be removed. I just had a question, were there any plans to, to keep any existing mature trees in that area at all? I don't know if they're not showing on here. I don't know, would, would you know? I'm talking about the trees within the lots themselves. Yes. So the lots themselves, those do have to come in as their own separate application. So at this point, there is there is not a application from the board on what would be proposed as a site plan and what mitigation or preservation would be proposed. That has not been decided upon yet. Okay. We'll go out to the board. Because I know this is showing trees to be removed, and usually in the past they've had existing trees remaining. So I'm, I don't want to make the assumption since I don't see any of that, that means nothing's going to be saved, but you're saying that's still coming down the pike? There has to be an application for that as part of a future application. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and then this shows that the, the wetlands are being filled in, and um, I just want to clarify that was, that's swift mud, yes. right? Those have been, those have been gone through all right. necessary with the uh, water management. Okay. 
Um, and the sidewalk, she said it was going to be eight feet connecting, which is great. I like that idea. Uh, I do like that right turn lane that you're extending it so that, like you said, it'll keep the traffic off of uh, Cranberry there and, and get them out of the way. <laughs> SAP, so I do like that. All right, that's it for now. Mayor. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Vice Mayor. Commissioner McDowell. Uh, yes, I'd like to chat about the stormwater pond that's across the street, down the street from these out parcels. I'm curious, why are, why are improvements being made to that pond or parcel instead of the existing pond that's close to parcel number five? That pond is for the roadway today. So that is the existing stormwater system for Cranberry Road and the okay. area and significant area to the west as well. So, so we are expanding upon the roadway's existing stormwater management feature. Okay, that explains that. Thank you very much. And is those pond, is that roadway pond improvement going to also be split 50-50? <coughs> That I'm not sure about, but I know the 50-50 agreement also has to come before the board as well. Because the 50-50 agreement in the backup materials that I'm seeing is for the road work improvements and the signal. And if this pond is for road work improvements, will the it would make sense then that it is part of the 50-50, but I need clarity on that. Yes, yeah, since it's part of the Cranberry Road improvements, it would be included in the 50-50, but only the stormwater attenuation for the road itself, not for the development. So only off-site improvements. Okay, so is the stormwater ponds for the on-site development going to be expanded, or is that at capacity to accommodate these five out parcels? Those five out parcels were designed and incorporated within that stormwater management feature already. That's right by pond five. Yep. I mean by parcel five. Yes. Excellent. The five lots were taken. So, and, I, and maybe this is a question for staff because condition one says uh, career lane intersection signalization and cranberry road work will be required to be done in 180 days and there's going to be the cost sharing coming back. Should we include the stormwater pond as part of that condition and agreement? to the stormwater pond but as for the the condition it was let me pull that up on my staff report so it was the developers agree the developers agreement for the traffic impact mitigation uh, and signalization to be required within 180 days for them to bring that to us to staff um, there is an application we actually have an application in house we wanted to give them enough time to get that in so we could get that uh, resolved through our legal and brought back before this commission. So that was the 180 days to give them that time to get that agreement in. It's related to the agreement and any other conditions as part of the agreement. Okay, so I, I sorry, I wasn't clear. Okay. The agreement currently says for signalization and the road work. Since it has been determined that this pond is part of the road work, should we include that pond as part of this condition and agreement for the 50-50. Okay, I'm, I misunderstood what you said and I'll ask our public work staff to uh, answer. For the record, Danny Quick, city engineer, yes. Thank you. <laughs> we, will, we will clarify that and add that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor, I didn't pay attention to the time. Do I have a few more minutes or I will need a round two? Um, there's no one else up with questions, so. Um, Try to be brief, but go ahead. Um, when are you expecting to, I know that the signal is not going to be done until after the development, but when are you planning to do the roadway improvements? For the record, Danny Quick, city engineer, once we get past this stage of the process, and as we go through and uh, negotiate and finalize the uh, the signalization agreement and all of those items, you know, we, we will come to agreement with the developer about when they're going to make the road improvements, when the signal is going to go up with respect to the schedule of them developing those sites. 
because we they are not going to be developing the sites, put up any buildings, and have any additional traffic, and be having an adverse impact at that intersection, and that in limbo before we get the improvements in. So we'll work all that out with them at the appropriate time as they get further into the process. And, and while you're doing all of that back, back end work, please be cognizant of Price Boulevard widening because people are gonna be skipping Price Boulevard, coming down Cranberry, going out to Toledo Blade. And the last thing we want is Price Boulevard to be under construction and Cranberry under construction. At we're the same we're time. improving Price Boulevard? Uh, yeah, last I heard we were. <laughs> um, is this coming back for a replat? Um, or are we approving the replat now? Because I see the blueprints and I just want yes. to... This is strictly for the development master okay. plan amendment. The replat will come um, at a later time before the committee. Um, and Mayor, I, I believe that's all. Thank you. You are welcome. Um, any closing arguments, staff? Staff has no closing arguments. Thank you. Thank you. Applicant? Appreciate your time and thank you very much. Great, you are welcome. So I'm closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I'll make a motion, Mayor. Go ahead, Commissioner. So my motion is going to reflect the request to change one of the conditions that staff agreed to. Um, let me find it. I make a mo I make a motion to approve the petition number DMA21-269 with the following conditions. Condition one, a developer's agreement for the traffic impact mitigation and cost sharing of the Cranberry Boulevard <coughs> Career Lane intersection signalization and the Cranberry Boulevard widening road work and road stormwater pond improvements will be required within 180 mm -hmm. days of the development master plan amendment approval and condition two as stated in the staff report. Based on the competent substantial evidence, the development master plan amendment complies with the ULDC. We have a motion on the floor to approve petition DMA-21-269, uh, including condition number one in the staff report. No, I changed it, ma'am. That's why I read condition one, because I changed the wording. I'm, I'm working on that. Oh, I apologize. Yes. Sorry. Let me start over. Um, I move to approve, the motion on the floor is to approve petition number DMA-21-269 with condition number one in the staff report. That should read a developer's agreement for the traffic impact mitigation and cost sharing of the Cranberry Boulevard Career Lane intersection signalization, the Cranberry Boulevard road work, um, and the stormwater mm -hmm. pond improvements will be required within 180 days of the development master plan approval, um, and including condition number two as stated in the staff report. Uh, Commissioner McDowell made that motion. Do I hear a second? Just clarify the motion, Mayor, if I may. Go ahead. I added the word cranberry widening project and widening stormwater road widening stormwater pond improvement. Do you have that, City Clerk? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Anything to that? Then let's vote. Do you see a tally on that? Oh, I see it. Um, motion carries five to zero. Moving on to PLF-22-229. Can we take a health break? Well, I was gonna go 15 or 20 minutes okay. more till eight o'clock. 
um, consideration of particip well, let me ask, how are my fellow commissioners feeling? Do you want to take a break now before we start this or just keep going? Yes, we do. Okay, PLF-22-229 Sunstone Village F5 Phase 2 Final Plat. This is a quasi-judicial um, session. City Clerk, would you read the petition title and swear in those wishing to give testimony? Consideration of petition number PLF-22-229 Sunstone Village F5 Phase 2 Final Plat. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge to help you guide? Yeah. Thank you. Any ex parte communications? Commissioner McDowell? No, ma'am. Commissioner Stokes? No, ma'am. No for me, Vice Mayor? No. Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. Okay. City Clerk, do we have any aggrieved parties for this item? Yeah. Then let's move on to presentations. Applicant, you're up first. Good evening, uh, Chris Fisher, Clearview Land Design, uh, 3010 West Azeal Street, uh, Suite 150, Tampa, Florida, 33609. Um, hi, my name is Chris Fisher. I'm here rep uh, representing the applicant, Madame Holmes. Uh, this is short and sweet. Uh, we are doing the second phase of Welland Park F5 uh, final plat. Uh, it consists of 102 single family lots. It's roughly 34.3 acres. Um, this is within the village F, uh, Part of Welland Park. Um, the uh, West Village's Improvement District has reviewed and approved the final plat, um, and this plat is in conformance with Chapter 177. Staff? Good evening again. For the record, Sherry Wilbeck Grandin, Planning and Zoning Division. I have been sworn. Uh, the petition, petition before you is Sunstone Village F5, Phase 2, Final Plat, Petition Number PLF-22-229. Um, the applicant is Chris Fisher, Clear, Clearview Land Design, on behalf of Madame Tampa, Sarasota, LLC. Property owner is Madame Tampa, Sarasota, LLC. This request is an approval for the final plat for Sunstone Village F5. It is located within uh, Village F, north of Manitoba <coughs> Beach Road, east of Franklin Boulevard, and west of Southwest Village's Parkway. The uh, plat comprises of 102 residential units, associated roadways, tracks, conservation areas, open space, access, drainage, utility, and street tree easements. The number of the proposed dwelling units falls within the allotted numbers permitted for Village F. It is located in um, the mixed-use residential neighborhood two. In June of 2021, the infrastructure and subdivision plans associated with this project were approved. A surety bond in the amount of $1,322,288 for on-site sanitu sanitary sewer and potable water was received. In addition, an, an additional bond of $1,295,916.60 was re received for phase two of the infrastructure improvements associated with this project. Um, here is an overview of the plat. Um, the previous uh, portion of Sunstone was approved by this commission. And for compliance with Florida statutes in ULDC Chapter 37, this final plat was reviewed and approved by the contracted city surveyor for conformance with Florida statutes, Chapter 177, Part 1. This final plat was reviewed for conformance with the approved infrastructure, INF 21-006, and the subdivision plan, SCP 21-028. The plans for... Welland Park, AKA West Villages F5. Um, this item was presented before the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board on March 2nd of 2023. By unanimous vote, the board approved this plat and the Planning and Zoning Division is um, asking and recommending approval of petition number PLF-22-229 Sunstone Village F5 Phase 2 Final Plat. Thank you. Thank you, staff. Applicant, do you have any rebuttal? Nothing further. Staff, 
Any rebuttal? Staff has no rebuttal. Thank you. City Clerk, do we have any online or in-house public comment for this item? Okay, thank you. Then I am opening up the floor to commissioner questions. I am not seeing any, so I am closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I'll make a motion. Go ahead, Commissioner Stokes. <clears throat> I move to approve petition number Mayor, P. Can you just make sure there are no closing arguments? There are probably not. Oh, thank no. you very, very much. Good point. Um, any closing arguments? Staff has no closing arguments. Thank you. Thought I asked for that. Agree, party. Any closing arguments? I'm not 100 percent sure. I said I was. I've been sworn in before, so I just want to make sure on the record I was sworn in. Thank you. We've got it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Stokes. I move to approve petition number PLF 22-229 as presented and find that based on the competent substantial evidence, the Sunstone Village F5 phase two plat complies with the Unified Land Development Code <coughs> in Florida Statute Chapter 177. Second. I have a motion on the floor to approve petition number PLF 22-229 as presented and find that based on the competent substantial evidence, the Sunstone Village F5 Phase 2 plat complies with the Unified Land Development Code and the Florida Statutes Chapter 177. The motion maker is Commissioner Stokes. The seconder is Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that, gentlemen? And let's vote. That's not picking up. Are you saying it, City Clerk? No, I'm not. What do you suggest? Let's vote. Here, let's try it again. Yep. <clears throat> Okay, go ahead and vote. <laughs> yeah, let's do a vo voice vote. Commissioner Emmerich? I'm trying to be a yes. <laughs> so Commissioner Emmerich is a yes. Vice Mayor? Yes. I'm a yes. Commissioner I'm, Stokes? I'm a yes. Commissioner McDowell? Yes, ma'am. And that motion passes <clears throat> five to zero. Thank you. Okay, we have 10 to 8, and I understand some of my fellow commissioners are under some duress. So I'm going to recess this meeting for 10 minutes. We will resume at 8 p.m. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. <laughs>
It is 8 p.m. and we are resuming the City Commission regular meeting. Please come to order. Shock. That was a WVI. Yeah. Quiet, please, in chambers. We're going to resume. Thank you. Moving on to item C, PLF. There's still a lot of no noise. I please. We're resuming. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to item number C, PLF-22-241, consideration of petition number PLF-22-241, Wallen Park Village E, Track 5, Replat. This yeah. is a quasi-judicial item, City Clerk. We don't have the city attorney or the city manager here, so we might want to wait for them for the oh. quasi-judicial item. Here they come. Here they come. Okay. We're waiting on you, city manager and deputy city attorney. <laughs> Everybody thought. City clerk, read this petition, please, by title and swear in those wishing to provide testimony. Consideration of petition number PLF 22-241, Welland Park Village E, Track 5, Replat. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge, so help you God? Okay. Any ex parte communications, Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. Vice Mayor White? Nothing. No for me. Commissioner Stokes? Uh, no, ma'am. Commissioner McDowell? None. Terrific. Um, City Clerk, do we have any aggrieved parties on this item? We do not. Okay, we're ready for presentations. Staff, I mean, excuse me, applicant first up. Is the, is the applicant here? Ah. We're going to need to swear in the applicant. Oh, please. Okay. City Clerk? <laughs> We have a tardy applicant. Yes, your soda machine was finicky. <laughs> it wouldn't take cash. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge to so help you, God? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Applicant, thank you for joining us. Do you have a presentation to make? Just a quick summary. This is a simple one. This is the replant of track five in Village E, which has been purchased and is under development for a charter school. Uh, in the future, they're gonna be uh, also putting in an early childhood center on track uh, 5B. And in the middle is a, an existing wetland preserved area that with the plat will be uh, dedicated to the West Village's Improvement District for ultimate ownership and maintenance. So the charter school Red Apple, who's well in the construction on their K through eight uh, college prep program, is really trying to wind to separate the two <coughs> buildings and the two separate uh, ownerships. And that is why we're doing the plat. That's it. Thank you, staff. Good afternoon, Carl Benj, AICP, Planning and Zoning Department. I have been sworn. Today we're here to talk about PLF 22241, the College Prep Academy at Welland Park. The College Prep Academy at Welland Park plat is a replat of the original Welland Park Village E plat, PLF 21200, which was included in associated with associated roadway, stormwater, and utility tracks and easement. This replat divides track five into three individual parcels. Track 5A, the College Prep Academy, Track 602, the wetland, and Track 5B, the future early learning center. The total site is plus or minus 12.0088 acres and is located within Village E of Welland Park. The major site and development plan, MAS 22080, for this plat was approved in September 2022 and a bond in the amount of $327,153.53 has been received by the city. The West Village's Improvement District and City Surveyor have re reviewed and approved the plat. Staff recommends City Commission approve PLF 22241. Thank you for that, staff applicant. Do you have any rebuttal? 
I do not. Staff, any rebuttal? We do not. Well, it's time for public comment, City Clerk. There is none. Okay, then let's move on. I am opening up the floor to commission questions. I'm not seeing any, so let's move on to closing arguments, staff. We have nothing, thank you. Applicant? I have nothing. Okay, then I'm closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I'll make a motion. Go ahead, Commissioner Stokes. <coughs> Excuse me. I move to approve petition number PLF 22-241 as presented <coughs> and find that based on the confident substantial evidence, the Welland Park Village E Track 5 replat complies with the uniform, uh, Unified Land Development Code and Florida Statute Chapter 177. Second. I have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner Stokes and seconded by Commissioner McDowell to approve petition number <coughs> PLF 22-241 as presented and find that based on the competent substantial <coughs> evidence, the Welland Park Village E Track 5 replat complies with the Unified Land Development Code and the Florida Statutes Chapter 177. Anything to that? And let's vote. And that motion carries five to zero. Thank you both. Moving on to PLF-22-273, consideration of petition number PLF-22-273, Prado Boulevard South Extension Platte. This is a quasi-judicial item. Uh, City Clerk, can you read the petition by title and swear in those wishing to provide testimony? Consideration of petition number PLF 22-273, Prater Boulevard, South Extension, Platte. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? So help you God. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Emrich, do you have any ex parte communications? No, ma'am. Vice Mayor, nothing. No for me, Commissioner Stokes. Nothing. Commissioner McDowell. Nothing, ma'am. Um, City Clerk, are there any aggrieved parties for this matter? Okay, then let's move on to presentations. Applicant? John Lazinski, Senior Vice President with Welland Park. I have been sworn in the normal course of business today and at the right time. This is a simple one. This is a, the dedication for, of right away with the extension of Prado Boulevard from its current terminus plus or minus about 500 feet south of Minnesota Beach Road down to the south property line, uh, I shouldn't say that, south line of the city of Northport uh, within Welland Park. Uh, all permits have been received. Uh, I know the one aerial picture makes it look like we cut into the wetland. We did not touch any of the wetlands for this roadway. We actually did, we got all those permits too. Roadway construction started and we should have this area paved, uh, this roadway paved by uh, Christmas time. And we are, as you may know, just to the west will be our village I Palmera neighborhood. We've already started processing that uh, development order and plans for an MAS. So that'll be the next neighborhood we open up. Okay. Thank you. Staff? Sure Good is. afternoon. Carl Benj, AICP, Planning and Zoning Division. I have been sworn. <clears throat> now we're talking about PLF 22273, the Prado Boulevard South Extension Plat. The Prado Boulevard South Extension Plat is a continuation of the original Prado Boulevard, INF 18293 which was included with associated roadway, stormwater, and utility tracks and easements. This plat is an extension of Prado Boulevard from the current intersection with Minnesota Beach Road, approximately 6,250 linear feet southwest to the city limits, as well as a replat of a portion of track 900. The total site is plus or minus 18.0137 acres and is located within Village E of Welland Park. The infrastructure plan, INF 22-222, and subdivision plan SCP-22-224 of this plat was approved in January 2023. The West Villages Improvement District and City Surveyor have reviewed and approved the plat. Staff recommends the City Commission approve PLF-22273. 
Thank you, staff. Any rebuttal applicant? I actually have one. Carl mentioned it's within in village E, and I just noticed for the first time, and the staff report looks like they cut and paste. This is actually between villages I and J. The college prep was in uh, village E. Okay. So just, that's it. Great, thank you for that. Okay. Staff, do you have any rebuttal? Uh, no, we do not, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, City Clerk, any public comment for this item? Okay, thank you. I'm opening up the floor to commission questions. No, I have nothing. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Stokes, you have a question? Just a very quick question. It, this is not yet connecting to Minnesota Beach Road, right? It's just... It just takes it and extends it, or is this actually currently Prado Boulevard extends south of Minnesota Beach Road? We have constructed Minnesota Beach Road from about 900 feet west of uh, Prado okay. to West Villages Parkway. We've paved about half of it from West Villages Parkway to River Road. We should have it paved to about 800 feet west of River Road uh, in the next 30 days. And then, then that actual connection at River Road will become part of the county's project on River Road. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Okay, you can go down there and drive around the traffic circle. And since you got me up here, in the southeast corner of the intersection of Prado and uh, Minnesota Beach Road is where the second fire station for the post annexation grant is going to go. Gotcha. And that site's already been filled and leveled, so gotcha. two, three years when it's needed to do that next fire station, it's already set. Thank you. Staff, do you have any closing arguments? Uh, now I have no closing arguments. <laughs> <laughs> An applicant? I have none. Thank you for that, gentlemen. Um, I'm closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I'll make it. Go ahead, Commissioner Stokes. All right, let's see. I move to approve petition number PLF 22-273 as presented and find that based on the competent substantial evidence, the Prado Boulevard South Extension Platte complies with the Unified Land Development Code and the Florida Statutes Chapter 177. Second. I have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner Stokes and seconded by Commissioner McDowell to approve petition number PLF 22-273 as presented and find that based on the competent substantial evidence, the Prado Boulevard South Extension plat complies with the Unified <coughs> Development Land Development Code and the Florida Statutes Chapter 177. Anything to that? And let's vote, please. And that motion passes five to zero. Thank, Thank you. you. On to um, DMP-22-118. Um, this is another quasi-judicial hearing. Um, City Clerk, can you read the petition title and swear in those wishing to give testimony? Consideration of petition number DMP 22-118 Northport 0010 Development Master Plan PID number 11180400010 located at the southeast corner of Activity Center 5. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge to so help you God? Uh, Commissioner uh, McDowell, any ex parte? I'm sorry, I was giggling. I saw the last minute uh, <laughs> swearing ins happening. It's um, time for ex parte if you have any. Um, I have emails from and to citizens, um, and I forwarded those to the city clerk um, for the record. And I also requested and received a copy of the traffic import impact statement 
which I also forwarded to the city clerk. Thank you for that, Commissioner Stokes. Nothing. Uh, none for me, Vice Mayor. No, nothing. And Commissioner Emmerich. No, ma'am. Are there any agreed parties for this matter, City Clerk? Yes, ma'am. Then let's go on to presentations. Applicant, you're up. Good evening. My name is Carl Fry with Stark Enterprises, and I have been sworn in. Uh, we're a developer located in Cleveland, Ohio. For the record, 39 Euclid Avenue, Suite 1300, 44114 is our zip. Um, we're proposing to do a, a townhome and apartment community in Activity Center 5. It was historically Truman Park, the area that we're looking at. It's the southeast most uh, portion of the southeast quadrant of that activity center. Um, we're developing approximately half of what was uh, currently platted for all of Truman Park. Um, the development will have 269 units, both apartments and townhomes, as I mentioned. One and two story towns, <coughs> approximately 200 townhomes, 59 uh, apartments in one building. That's what we're proposing. The project will be sited on an extension of Citizens Parkway, the east west leg of that road, which is uh, already in an, uh, set aside an easement, which is part of the Activity Center's uh, Property Owners Association. And the stormwater management will also be on that parcel that's part of the association's properties. We'll develop that stormwater release we're proposing to or coordination with the city and, uh, and the association on this, but to accommodate all of Citizens Parkway. So we'll, while we'll be constructing the east-west leg, the north-south leg of that road um, will be accounted for in, in the stormwater management. Um, the traffic report that you mentioned, was there was an initial assessment done for this project. The intersection of Citizens Parkway, which already exists on the west side of uh, Little Blade Boulevard, was improved originally when this uh, area was master planned and, and development was initiated. And I don't think there were any additional improvements for that intersection. Those turn lanes are adequate. The project will be entirely uh, for rent community. Stark is a vertically integrated company, so we intend to develop um, construct, own, and manage long-term the property. And uh, we take take pride in, in trying to provide a, a nice set of amenities for our residents. So there will be a clubhouse with pool, uh, fitness rooms, uh, work areas, playground, and sports <coughs> courts, all part of part of the development. And, and we also have uh, on the plan and request of the planning staff some accommodation for some mixed-use buildings. Because we're kind of in the remote section of this, it's not a fully built out quadrant. So um, we'll be able to have some additional amen uh, amenities or support type uses for this community within our development. Thank you. You're welcome, staff. All right, good evening. For the record, Noah Fossick, AISP, and I have been sworn. We're here to discuss DMP 22118 this evening. This presentation will be divided into five parts, an overview of the project, the development master plan, conceptual elevations, compliance with local and state regulations, and an analysis of the proposed development. The proposed development is located to the east of Toledo, Toledo Blade Boulevard, approximately <coughs> half a mile south of Price Boulevard, west of Blue Ridge, Blue Ridge Waterway, and north of the Bobcat Trail community. The site is part of Activity Center 5 and is zoned planned community development. In sum, the proposed development includes 269 residential units, two 13,200 square feet mixed use buildings, and the construction of a portion of Citizens Parkway Southeast. 
The residential portion is shown on the screen and is includes 202 townhome units in a mix of four, six, and six unit structures, uh, 63 apartment units in one four story structure, and four duplex units in two, two unit structures. The mixed use area um, includes two mixed use buildings, the clubhouse, and other amenities such as the mail kiosk. Uh, on the screen now is the portion of Citizens Parkway that will be constructed, which will connect to Toledo Play Boulevard and uh, include a roundabout for a turnaround at the end. The access points to the development are, are shown on the screen. There are three separate accesses. And last is the stormwater, which is a shared system which is consistent with the ULDC section 5535A5, which requires uh, the stormwater in this quadrant of the activity center to be a centralized system. On the screen now are the conceptual elevations for the mixed use in the clubhouse buildings. Now the four and six unit townhome buildings. Last, the apartment building and the two unit duplexes. The applicants held a neighborhood meeting virtually on January 20th. The requisite documents, the notice, the agenda, and the minutes have been provided and can be found in your backup material. A legal ad was published in the Daily Sun on February 24th. And the postcard mailers were sent to all property owners within a quarter mile radius of the proposed <clears throat> development on February 28th. Staff has re reviewed this petition for compliance with the comprehensive plan. Uh, we would what, like to note uh, specific elements of the comprehensive plan that uh, you'll see that staff has found this uh, petition in compliance with, particularly Future land use element goal two, which states the city, the city shall promote an intensive mixture of employment, goods and services, and residential uses in activity centers. The proposed development is providing both residential units and space for retail office and other or other non-residential uses, uh, which meets this goal. Additionally, housing element policy 6.1 states this city shall ensure a compatible relationship between new housing and circulation patterns and encourage pedestrian and bicycle interconnectivity in transit friendly communities in order to minimize traffic impacts and promote healthy lifestyles. The proposed development is providing convenient access directly from the residential portion to the non residential portion through a series of sidewalks. The residents of the community will also be able to access the rest of the activity center and the city via sidewalks and bicycle lanes that will be part, built as part of the Citizens Parkway. Um, and the proximity to retail and services will encourage the residents to travel by non-motorized means, whether that is for commuting, uh, accessing retail, or for leisure. Uh, the rest of the analysis, including the, element, the goals, objectives, and policies listed on this uh, slide can be found in the staff report. Staff has also reviewed this for consistency with the Unified Land Development Code. Uh, the proposed development does include a mixture of uses, which meets the intent of the PCD district. Uh, the uses are also listed as permitted in sections 53.103 and 55.36. Um, and it, the proposed development is providing all the requirements of the PCD district uh, as found in section 53.113 of the ULDC including the 40 foot wide perimeter buffer in the minimum 30% open space. Staff has also performed a fiscal impact analysis, which showed a potential of $1,402,374 of net benefit over the first five years of the project. Lastly, the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board heard this petition at their March 16th meeting and voted to recommend approval to the City Commission. 
So based on the evidence presented to you today, staff is recommending that the city commission approve BMP 22118. Thank you. Thank you, staff. Applicant, any rebuttal? No, ma'am. Staff? Staff has no rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, city clerk, any online or in-house public comment? Doug McNamee. Thank you, uh, City Commissioners and City Manager Fletcher. My name is Doug McNamee. I'm a 16 year uh, resident of Northport, residing at 1515 Palmetto Palmway and Bobcat Trail. I'm also a former chairman of the Bobcat Trail Community Development District. Yes, this is the same Bobcat Trail that is suffering from the mismanagement of the owner of the former Charlotte Harbor National Golf Club, Mr. Richard Regis Smith III. Mr. Smith and Hurricane Ian irreparably harmed uh, the Bobcat Trail community. However, I do wish to formally thank the city for the remarkable resources provided to us during the post-hurricane cleanup. Thank you. I'm here tonight to discuss agenda item 5E, the consideration petition BMP 22118. I respectfully request the city commission require the developer to install a barrier wall between the proposed development and our community. Our community is resilient. We will recover from the scandal ridden owner of the golf course and the forces of nature that damaged our homes. Please do not take away our security and what serenity we have remaining. Please install the wall. Thank you and God bless. The next three are Jean Upset, Janet Geyer, and Tammy Holmes. Good evening. My name is Jean Upset. I've been a resident of Bobcat Trail since 2005. For years, it was a wonderful community. Wonderful. Over the last couple of years, the community has started to fail, not because of what we have done to it, but because of what others have done to us. We have the failing golf course. We have had damage from Irma then damage from Ian. So I look to you today, and I appreciate the difficult role that you have. You have the role in supporting progress for Northport, which I totally get. I totally understand. We need to move towards the future. But you also have the role of protecting the communities in Northport that currently exist. And that is why we come to you today begging, begging that we have some type a barrier that will protect us from 200, and the number changed. The number I originally had was 260. I believe he said tonight, 269. They are going to be rental properties. In addition to that, we have activity center number five, which is a combination of commercial properties. In addition to that, we have a 144 bed mental health facility that is being built right in the same area. I, I reviewed your development plan and the concerns that I have are related to one, the barrier, which Doug has already mentioned to you, two, the noise, Gate access, we have gate access. Hurricane Ian and Irma destroyed our tree barriers. We no longer have a barrier to the noises that come to us from Toledo Blade. We no longer will have barrier because of the new extension of Citizens Parkway. We understand progress, 
but we need to be protected. Condition number one, and I better hurry up, condition number one uh, talks of the gopher tortoises. I did not hear that mentioned in your staff report or in the developer's report. 65 burrows of gopher tortoises were found on this property. I know that the wildlife folks will be involved. Um, Ma'am, your time is this, up. I'm uh, sorry. I, I appreciate it. <clears throat> One last thing. Please I'm build so, I'm please sorry. build a barrier. We'll take care of your go. Your time tortoises. is up. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners. Um, my my name is Janet Geyer. I'm a supervisor for the uh, Bobcat Trail CDD, and I am deeply concerned that this proposed development. DMP 22118 that will be adjacent to Bobcat Trail could have significant impacts to the residents of our community. I do appreciate your role in this decision and how it impacts the entire community of Northport. I understand the need for residential housing, and I'm sure this development is a much needed project. However, the added commercial aspect of the development and the associated grocery and gas station and the um, behavioral health hospital that is um, being installed, which all appear to have vehicle or non-vehicle access to this new project. And a tree buffer does not appear to be adequate to prevent individuals from crossing into Bobcat Trail property. I'm deeply concerned about the safety of our residents and their families. Gopher tortoise relocation will delay the project somewhat, I presume. But if this project is approved, I would strongly suggest <clears throat> that the developer be required to construct a more substantial barrier, such as a fence or a wall. Really appreciate your um, consideration. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Kathy Little and John Swellick. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for your time in listening to our comments and suggestions. Um, with regard to Bobcat Trail, I am not only a resident, but I am the vice president of the Mayor. Bobcat Trail um, Master Homeowners Could Association. Please stop for time for a moment, Mayor. Mayor, could, you could she stop state the time for a minute? Could she state her name and that she was sworn, please? Yes. I'm Kathy Little, and I was sworn. Thank you so much. I appreciate this question. Um, so again, I am the vice president of the Master Homeowners Association there at Bobcat Trail. And um, I did read in the staff notes, there was a comment about um, protecting adjacent <coughs> properties from adverse effects of the development. Yet I didn't see the details of what that might be. So I would like a little more clarification on that, what the plan is, when it's going to be in place, and if there isn't one, when can we expect a plan? Um, we expect, as everyone does in their own homes, security and privacy. Um, we make our own decisions of where we're going to live and why. Um, and everyone in Bobcat Trail, one of the factors is that it was a gated community, and we expected and had a reasonable expectation to maintain that. Like the others have mentioned with the um, hurricanes and such, some of that has been tainted. But we would like to know from the developer, at minimum, what they're referring to in the staff notes that we would, the properties protecting them against adverse effects of the development. It looks like in their plan, the community areas and pools are going to be the closest backing up to Bobcat Trail. So that's a lot more traffic than maybe what would be at one building, human traffic, I'm sorry. Um, so is the, they also showed three entrances going in, in the, in the plan. Are those gonna be gated entrances? And if so, are they going to have a human um, 
guards at those posts because that would make a difference also of the closeness and proximity to Bobcat Trail. So I just wanted to point that out, make sure it's on the record that we're requesting that information. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is John Swalick. I live at 2149 Silver Palm uh, in Bobcat Trail. Uh, much of what I was going and to say today sworn, has... Have pardon? you been sworn, sir? Did you swear? Yes, I did. Okay, I stood up there you. and raised my hand. Great, thank you. <laughs> but I'll do it again. No, no that's good. <laughs> but anyway, I, I won't, because of the lateness of the hour, and the fact that uh, these I items have been so eloquently but before you by my neighbors, I'll try to skip over the things that I was going to say. But many of my other neighbors are here today uh, because of the concern that we have about the uh, wall or lack of it uh, that uh, we feel is necessary between <coughs> our properties, which are on Charlotte Harbor National Golf Course, as it was once constituted, and the new proposal. Uh, yeah, I realize that growth is inevitable. There's no question about it, and good plan growth is important. But as citizens who have lived here and invested in this property, I think it's important that you hear these concerns and consider them in your deliberations. Well, we're concerned about, as everybody has indicated already, that about the safety and, and the environment and other issues which relate to the development. And we want to... Uh, we feel that already the actions, or perhaps inactions, of the former or the current owner, Rich Smith, have diluted the value of, of our property the way it was and the integrity of the entire area. So we ask you at this moment for your support and our requests for a wall to uh, have a safe and strong environment uh, for our community. Thank you. Well, thank you, City Clerk. Um, I'm opening up the floor to commission questions. Commissioner McDowell. Uh, yes, Mayor. Um, my first concern is naming of the road Citizens Parkway. And I don't know if I need staff or maybe fire chief or police chief. Because Citizens Parkway is intended to loop around with different quadrants, um, we have a very transient area, lots of visitors. I am deeply concerned about naming this quadrant of Citizens Parkway because most people <clears throat> think of Citizens Parkway across the street by Palm Port and the fire station and the school bus yard. Has staff or anybody considered the possibility of changing this name for safety's sake? Staff has not considered that. However, I will note that the roadway is already platted as Citizens Parkway Southeast, so that is the name on the plat and for the roadway. Uh, certainly it is platted as a public roadway, so this body could consider today or at a future commission hearing the potential of renaming it, should you see fit. Well, I'm not sure when they plan to start development and if it's been platted as just a name change, nothing's been developed. I'm sure that that plat, um, that plat name can be changed. Um, I know a lot of times they'll put in a temporary name um, just so that way then they can see that it is a roadway. Right. Uh, Lori Barnes, Planning and Zoning Manager. I have not been sworn. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge to so help you God? I do. Thank you. Um, the city in the city code, there are processes for requesting a name change for a street. Uh, since this is a platted public right of way, the city commission um, would need to provide direction to the city manager to make that request. Uh, the request would need to include five proposed street names, which would be vetted by the Sarasota County property appraiser for duplication purposes, and then a final name could be selected. Um, there would be a public hearing 
to establish the new street name, and then a replat would be required to update the name of the street on the plat. Thank you for that um, information. Um, I think that would be a wise step to take well before the development happens. So I'll get with city manager on that. Um, what is the buffering that is going to be required to be installed? So along the southern portion of the property, there is a 40 foot wide buffer uh, that includes a landscape buffer. Um, and that is consistent along the eastern property line along uh, Blue Ridge Parkway as well. Or Blue Ridge Waterway. So the southern is going to have a 40 foot landscape buffer. Correct, yes. And the eastern side that's along the canal is going to have a 40 foot buffer. Correct. There's no wall required? A wall is not required in this circumstance as the uses uh, budding each other are residential on a residential use, so it does not require a wall. Okay. If the developer was amenable to putting up a wall, the city would not prevent that? The city would not. Um, however, there may be certain requirements of a wall that we would have to verify um, depending on what would be proposed. Okay. And it meets all requisite requirements. Thank you. Um, the clubhouse and uh, the other amenities, are those going to be open? That The other amenities that are located in the mixed use area, are those going to be open to the public? Clubhouse and amenities will be for residents. No, residents. The mixed use area, those could contain components that would be gen open to the general public. Are any of the 269 or whatever that number, magic number is for the dwelling units, are any of those going to be affordable housing? Uh, the, the total number has always been 269, and it okay. is all a market rate price. Is the so I understand there's an area for mixed use, and then there's the area of development for the dwelling units. Is the dwelling units area, is that going to be gated? So, correct. The residential component will be gated in two driveways. Will it be gated on all sides? It'll be gated for vehicular access. One more question, Commissioner. I have a long list. If that's fine, well, if you I want to go to ahead, uh, I'll come back. You need a round two. Okay. Yes, I do. Thank, thank you. you for that. I appreciate it. Vice Mayor White. Yes, um, thank you. And Commissioner McDowell asked some of my questions already. And the board, the buffer is going to be a Type C buffer. Do I have that correct? Is and is that correct. one? Is that one tree every twenty feet or something like that? It is one canopy tree every forty feet on center. Okay. Okay. And does that include shrubs in between the trees? It does, correct. And and what is that spacing again? I believe that is every three feet on center. Uh, and is that the southern portion as well as the portion along the canal? Yes, or ditch correct. ditch back there? Okay. And that's going to have the same uh, one tree every 40 feet. And I've mentioned before we need to talk about yes, that. Yes, correct, Ms. <laughs> In the, in the future, okay. Um, and this is a gated community, although there's, well, I guess Bob Cattrell was the same way. It's, it's a gated community, but you don't have a wall going up to prevent people from walking in from the ditch either, do you? From, to your own community, is that right? Correct, there is no wall proposed on the southern portion of the or property. Or a fence or anything like that. Correct, yes. Okay. That's my understanding. Okay. I'm just trying to wrap my head around that, that this is gated, but it really has openings, just like gated for cars. vehicular. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you uh, for clarifying that. Um, wait, I think I had another question. Oh, and is there, did this project qualify for like a percentage of green space that was supposed to be? That is to be left or is or no? That requirement pertains to subdivisions. Thank you. 
I'm going to move on. Yes, Vice Mayor, Go do ahead. you need a second? No, nope. I don't. I'm fine. Okay, Commissioner Stokes, you're next. I have just one question. Mm -hmm. Would you build a wall? <laughs> you do not let them build that. If it meant the difference between approval or disapproval, would you build a wall? I don't know that I can answer that, not knowing the economics of that. I mean, what, what the wall criteria is. And, and Commissioner, if I may, the wall is not a requirement of the Unified Land Development Code. Uh, so this body, without uh, tangible evidence or, or a, a rational nexus for a wall being required, uh, shouldn't require a wall under advisement from staff. Um, it, because it is not a requirement of the Unified Land Development Code. We would need some uh, tangible evidence as to why a wall would be required. Thank you for your comments. Are you done, Commissioner? Oh, yeah. Thank okay. you. Commissioner Emmerich. Yeah, I got a couple questions. <laughs> um, going back to the, the street, um, being called Citizens Parkway. You stated that it was Citizens Parkway Southeast, correct? Yes, correct, Commissioner. What is the other Citizens Parkway? Is that just Citizens Parkway? Uh, across to the west, it is known as Citizens Parkway Southwest. Okay, well, they're the different is what I'm getting at. Correct. Because <laughs> yes. we have Salford, we have North Salford, we have Cranberry, we have North Cranberry. Yes. I don't see, I see a difference to where it doesn't need to be changed is all I'm getting at on that aspect of it when it comes down to it. My second question has to deal with this wall. Have we looked at how long it needs to be and what the cost factors could be if there was a wall implemented in there? That's part A of my question. Uh, staff has not looked into the feasibility of a wall um, because it is not a requirement. No, I understand. I understand, but has it been looked into by maybe the developer or something to where if, it, I know it's not required, and I know we're not going to force you to do that, but in between the two developments, it may be meaningable to get with both parties involved to share the cost of the wall on implementation if that so means. And then we can work on that afterwards. But, you know, I know cost is prohibited and, and, it, and it has a lot to do with your development, but being good neighbors and working together may be feasible as well. But that's between y'all. We can't force you to do that. So that was just a suggestion and possible compromise. So thank you for listening. Commissioner McDowell. Yes, ma'am. And Commissioner Emmerich, I had that in my notes about a wall being a 50-50 proposition between the two developments. So um, how many jobs uh, in the fiscal analysis? It didn't mention how many jobs the mixed-use area was going to create. Could you please let me know that? Uh, certainly, we can look into getting you that information. We don't have that on hand, unfortunately. Do you have that available in the next couple of minutes? <laughs> um, well, unfortunately, uh, the staff that was uh, created the fiscal impact analysis is not here tonight. Um, I'm not certain without asking him whether that an impact analysis included an output for the amount of jobs created. Um, in the traffic impact statement, it mentioned uh, looking at and had traffic counts for Janine and Hallmark. And I had to go look and see where is Janine and Hallmark in relation to this development. And I realized that there's a little area that can cross, go across the canal. Is it intended to require them to build a vehicular bridge across that canal for connectivity? So part of the uh, chapter 55 of the Unified Land Development Code does require the developer to at least explore the potential um, feasibility of constructing a bridge across the waterway. Um, the initial, um, during the initial uh, planning of the site, that was explored. However, it is not um, feasible because of the private owners uh, across the canal and their willingness to, um, you know, sell their property. Uh, so there's no logical oh. path across without purchasing private property and none of the private property owners 
we're willing to sell property for that purpose. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is my big last question. And I will get to it, so please give me a little latitude. The mixed use is 2,600 square feet. And I'm a visual person, and that 2,600 feet is approximately the size of $2 generals at Cranberry and Price, give or take a little bit. So it's like 20, great. Tw I'm sorry, 26,000. So it's like about an acre. And of that, the amenity center, which you said is part of mixed use, and the mail kiosk, those things are not going to be accessible to the public. So figuring it's even an acre, one acre of mixed use for a 26,000 square foot multi-use building open to the public to create jobs unknown <clears throat> compared to the 32 acres of the entire property, in my opinion, is not mixed use. You're putting a little spot on a 32 acre parcel. And that concerns me because the intent is to have it be mixed use. The intent is it for it to create jobs. The intent of planned community development is to <coughs> maximize the economic benefit to the community. Two little 13,000 square foot properties about the size of a Dollar General when you take into consideration the parking lot is not mixed use and is not economically <coughs> beneficial. So my question is, how did you arrive that this was economically beneficial to the community with the size in comparison to the whole property? Yes. Either one. So my understanding, the Portions of the entire activity center have been predefined. How much was allocated for office? How much was allocated for commercial use? How much was allocated for residential? So we are in compliance with that. As I mentioned at the beginning, this 60 some acre tract of Truman Park was originally in the original developer had planned for townhomes. So we're developing approximately half of that. There's still another 20 five to 30 acres available for other development. I think we are consistent with what was outlined by the, uh, the activity center and, and the guide. There's and if I may add, the land development code does not have a specific percentage exactly. requirement for mixed use. So there is not a percentage by which we can hold them to um, to qualify it as a mixed use development. Um, by providing these two non-residential mixed use buildings, they are meeting the definition of a mixed use development. Um, and those can provide any array of non-residential uses that are permitted within the activity center. Um, and as the applicant mentioned, the 26.9 acres of residential is within and compliant with the comprehensive plan in terms of the remaining residential density, um, medium density residential that is uh, in the activity center. So all elements of this development are compliant with the Unified Land Development Code and the comprehensive plan. Um. The developer uh, mentioned something about an original development that was for townhomes. When was that approved? It was presented to planning. It, it never, it never was. Okay, so that's not even on the table. Other than it's, it's history. I mean, it was community history. The original develop activity center had this component. It's, this is not a new idea. Okay. By, by that, and and I'll just, you know, mention. I think there's a, been a Wawa gas station. There's been. Rinaldi, maybe there's a behavioral mental and all those. But those projects were all part of the overall mixed use aspect of this activity center, right? But individually, they may not have had a mixed use. And that's what I'm focusing on. 
each but, parcel. But, in, but is, in total is, is where you get to mix the use, right? I think, um, did you want to speak? If I may, Commissioner McDowell, a, a response to your question about the analysis for job creation. The Unified Land Development Code, the fiscal analysis required for a development master plan does not require evaluation for a number of jobs created associated with a development master plan. The purpose of the fiscal analysis is to ascertain whether the project would provide a net benefit to the city or if providing public services to the project would be a draw on the city. Lori Barnes, <coughs> Planning and Zoning Manager. I've been sworn. <laughs> Mayor, Ms. Barnes, you might want to stay close. <laughs> Mayor, unfortunately, that's all the questions I have. I'm not convinced this meets the intent. I, I have a couple of questions. Um, I seem to recall in our activity center definitions that we have a recommended cap on what percentage of the land area in that activity center can be residential. Can you refresh my memory on what it is for this activity center and where we are at in either meeting or exceeding that number? Absolutely. The maximum medium density residential allowed in activity center five uh, is 4%. This development would push that total to that cap. So it's it's all that's remaining of the medium density residential within this activity center, but it is within the allowed um, totals. <laughs> Commissioner, you have another question? I, I'm gonna go into comments if you're done yeah, with I your just, questions. Yeah, I just, you prompted another question. If they are capping this out, that means there's no more residential allowed on an activity center five? That is correct. Yes, the high density residential is also um, capped out and no low density residential mm -hmm. is permitted currently. So, however, yes, uh, vertically integrated uh, mixed use projects, including residential, uh, would be allowed. Um, that is to say that that's the only way residential would be allowed going forward in this activity center as that would be calculated using uh, commercial or other non-residential um, <coughs> densities. Or if, if I may tag team on you a little bit, Commissioner McDowell. That's um, what this is all about. Go so, right for it. <laughs> so mixed use, um, our current code is rather vague in terms of defining what that means. We're working on fixing that. Um, and I seem to recall that where we're headed is a maximum limit of 75% residential on in any mixed use project. Am I kind of remembering? Lori Barnes, Planning and Zoning Manager, I have been sworn. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, the, the zoning chapter of the ULDC rewrite that's coming forward to commission for workshop, um, staff is proposing 75% uh, maximum residential and vertically integrated or in our our new mixed use one district. Right. Um, so 75% would be the maximum. In our mixed use two district, it would only permit vertically integrated mixed use. Mixed use. Yeah, so this is really a tough one because we have big gaping loopholes in our current ULDC and in my mind, this project is driving a Mack truck right through those loopholes, and that doesn't make me happy. But it's legal in terms of our current code, so I'm feeling stuck. Um, I share Commissioner McDowell's um, concern that this project really doesn't meet the spirit of what we want to see in our mixed-use developments, but we really don't 
um, we don't have a legal leg to stand on relative to that. So I, I want to make a comment on buffers. Um, you know, the, the Bobcat community has undergone much adversity in the past couple of years um, through no fault or doing of their own. And I'm enormously sympathetic uh, to that. Bobcat is in my district and I drive by it every day and it breaks my heart. Um, in light of that, I really appreciate that the public commenters here today aren't rejecting the project out of hand, which is what we, we hear most often. We don't want anything there. You know, you've really sort of accepting that you're just looking for some kind of accommodation in buffers. Um, I don't know if it has to be a wall or more intense vegetation, but I do hear the request for more buffering between the projects. Um, in reviewing the site map or the sketch that's here in the documentation, I'm happy to see that the more intense development is on the Citizens Parkway side of the project and not on the Bobcat side. Um, but I think the request of this abutting community is a reasonable one for us to at least consider. Again, I, I think there's nothing that <laughs> requires, clearly, that's nothing that requires the developer to put in a wall or more enhanced buffering in that area. But I would appeal to you in terms of being a good neighbor that you seriously consider working with staff in the community. I mean, I mean if a if a wall itself is really economically burdensome, and I like the 50-50 idea, I think that was um, really a, a good compromise, but that's a pretty long area. And if both parties find that wall to be too burdensome financially, maybe there's some other buffering that could be considered. Um, but I would strongly encourage staff and the developer to see if you can't make some kind of voluntary um, accommodation for this community who who has really really had it rough and um, and and I really do sympathize with them. Uh, with that, um, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, my comments were similar to what you were saying about this community and the wall. And walls are very 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 expensive. And it sounds like it's not the aesthetics that you're looking for, it's more the security. So a fence gives you that security. And a fence is much more cost friendly. And again, you know, you can put up an eight foot fence or six foot fence much quicker, easier, cheaper than a wall. Walls are very, very hard to maintain, um, and they're very expensive, as I said. Um, I don't think we can require this because it's not in our code. But we can condition it that staff get with the developer and your HOA to see if there is an amenable plan um, between the two of you guys, the, the two entities, and kind of talk it out and see if there's a meeting of the minds. That's all we can do legally. But legally, we can say that this development is not meeting the intent of the comp plan for this activity center and the ULDC. I understand there are no percentages, but the intent is crystal clear to maximize the economic benefit. And $2 general sized buildings do not equal that on a 32 acre person. So I said my piece and whenever you're ready, Mayor, I will be happy to make a motion. Commissioner Stokes. I'd like to echo the mayor and Commissioner McDowell's comments, you know, Bobcat community 
has had a rough time of it. And the applicant mentioned that you're a vertically integrated organization. You intend to build it and operate it and be a neighbor. And while I appreciate the city can't mandate a wall, too bad. Um, at the same time, I would really urge the applicant to spend time, think this through, and find a way to accommodate the sensitivities of the folks in Babcock. I mean, this is, you know, this is a problem. We're talking high density. There's a lot of activity there. They mentioned a lot of things that are happening in and around their area. A wall, uh, intense, thick vegetation, fence, whatever it might take. I, I would certainly urge the applicant to find a way to address this issue so that going forward, you can live together as good neighbors. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Uh, Vice Mayor White, final comments? Uh, yes, I, I really appreciate all the conversations and some of the things that my fellow members here brought up. It's interesting. Um, I just want to say I, I empathize with um, people in Bobcat Trail. There are those of us sitting up here who remembers when that development was built. Um, uh, I think three of us were here when that was. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's when the hot air balloon used to land yes. in that property. Yes. Okay. Um, and I just, um, yes, I was wanted to know about what's required, and if it's not required, we can't we can't require it. Uh, not having a a wall or a fence, and I, what I've always told people about the environment is you can't control what happens on somebody else's property, but you can control your, your own, and I would encourage um, Bobcat Trail to, to I don't know if you have a plan to start replacing the trees and, and the buffer and that was there and whatever is put in to, um, to add to that so you have more of what was there that you were enjoying. Um, I go through the same thing when people call me and say they're, they're clearing the lot next to me. And I said, yes, you enjoyed all of that, but it, it wasn't yours. You can control what's on your property. And I do like the idea of encouraging the, the applicant to, to work with them and see what can be done. Um, and I, I, I think that's, that's all we can, can hope to do. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, um, staff, do you have any closing arguments? Uh, staff would just like to reiterate that the uh, project is in compliance with the Comprehensive Plan and the Unified Land Development Code, and we do recommend approval of this project. Thank you. Applicant? I'd, I'd just like to add to the <coughs> residents. We, we had a, a neighborhood meeting, and I don't recall that the wall got brought up, so I wasn't really prepared for that. I know that came through in an email uh, more recently. It sounds like there is definitely some interest in some kind of barrier. I don't know what the perceived security risk is and why it's only one direction, um, but I think that your comments as far as enhanced buffer um, is something that, that we can definitely consider and work with them. It, again, I think there's four different buffering criteria that are in your code we're in compliance with. Um, it's it's the type C buffer, there's a 20 foot landscape buffer, there's a 40 foot buffer, another buffer that's twice the building height. So you've looked at all those and our buildings are actually um, more like 60 feet off the property line. And that property line by and large abuts the golf course, which is now fallow. So we're, our units will probably be 200 feet from the closest residence or more. but. But I understand and am sympathetic that, you know, this is a, going to be a change to the neighborhood. And, it, and if there's some things we can do landscape wise, I think that's um, all within, within uh, we just haven't gotten that level of detailed design yet, but something that we'll definitely consider and work with our la landscape architect on and, and with staff to, to make sure that we have a, a, a nice healthy buffer and our good neighbors. Right. Thank you. I really appreciate your expressed willingness to to, as our city manager would say, figure it out. So um, I appreciate that. Okay, at this point, I'm closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I'll make a motion, Mayor. Commissioner McDowell, go ahead. I'll make a motion to deny DMP 22-118 
and find that based on the competent substantial evidence presented, this development will adversely affect public interest, general welfare, health and safety for the following reasons. The proposed development is not consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies in the comp plan and does not meet the intent of the zoning district as defined in the ULDC and does not maximize the potential for economic benefit. Would you like to read that back? The city mm -hmm. clerk, our recording secretary, would you like him to I have it written McDonald's down. I'll be happy to, to provide it. I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat the motion? I have it written down. I can provide it. Yes, please. You want me to repeat it? Please. Motion to deny the DMP 22-118 and find that based on the substantial competent evidence presented, this development will adversely affect public interest, general welfare, health, and safety for the following reasons. The proposed development is not consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies in the comp plan and does not meet the intent of the zoning district as defined in the ULDC and does not maximize the potential for economic development. Do I have a second? That motion fails for lack of a second. Uh, would someone else like to take a crack at it? Yeah, I'll make a motion. Okay, Vice Mayor, go ahead. And we we can still make amendments to a motion. Correct? Sure. So if somebody wants to do that, all right, but just get the ball rolling here. I make a motion to approve um, DMP 22118 as presented and find that based on the competent substantial evidence, the Northport 0010 development master plan meets the standards in section 53-7 of the Unified Land Development Code. We have a motion on the floor made by Vice Mayor White. It's pretty much word for word. Do you yep. have that recording, Secretary? Yes, would you like me to repeat it? Yes, please do. Uh, to approve petition number DMP 22 118 as presented and find that based on the competent substantial evidence, the North Port 0010 development master plan meets the standards in section 53-7 of the Unified Land Development Code. Thank you for that recording, Secretary. Do I hear a second? Second. Um, I have some discussion on that motion that I'd like to put out and that is in the staff report. <coughs> there is, hope I'm on the right one, yep. Um, there is a list of conditions and safeguards. And I think we should see those in the motion. So if you look at page three, there are one through 11 conditions and safeguards. I don't have, I don't have that. I'm on page three, but I'm not on your page three. Well, I'm looking at the staff report. Okay. I'll make an amendment, Mayor. Okay, go ahead. I'll make an amendment to the motion to include all conditions and safeguards outlined in the staff report numbers one through 11. Do I have a second on that amendment? I'll second. Okay, so we have an amendment on the floor to, to modify the motion to include the conditions and safeguards in the staff report um, one through 11. Anything to that? Let's vote on the amendment. Oh, oh, Ms. No, that's no, right. You're all set. You put the amendment conditions in there. So that amendment passes five to zero. 
May I make another amendment? Sure, go ahead. Mayor, I'd like to make an amendment to have a additional condition number 12 added to have staff, the developer, and the Bobcat Trail HOA meet to discuss the security concerns and see if there is a amicable resolution. We have another amendment on the floor and do you wanna repeat that Commissioner McDowell? Add a condition number 12 to have staff, the developer and the HOA meet to discuss the HOA's con security dis concerns to determine if there is a amicable solution. Do I have a second on that amendment? Do I second that? Okay, seconded by Commissioner Stokes. Um, recording secretary, do you wanna repeat that? The final, the amendment? The final motion? No, the amendment itself. Uh, to add a condition 12, to have staff developer and the Bob, Bobcat Trail HOA meet to discuss the security concerns and see if there is an amenable resolution. Sounds pretty good. I have a question. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Well, I have a question. Um, if this is requiring them to meet, and if the, it's a if, if they don't come to a, an agreement, what happens? Nothing. Me, nothing meaning all we are doing is making this development if i'm sorry mayor mayor go ahead all we are doing is making the developer and staff and the hoa understand that there will be a meeting and if they can reach an amicable decision fantastic if they can't there's nothing more we can do we are requiring them to meet with those three parties. okay I, my That's i guess it. my question was this is not going to be the, the, the project's not gonna be dependent on whether they come to a, an agreement right. or not. It, it would not be dependent. <coughs> okay, All we are doing that's is what conditioning I was... that they meet. Mate. They meet. Okay, right. right. Okay. Probably not our purpose. Uh, yeah. So did I hear a second on that one, Commissioner yes. Stokes? I'd like to oh, I'm so to just sorry, a... yeah. Deputy City Attorney. I, did, I have a, it, I know a problem with this as long as the petitioner agrees to this and then I don't know that you're going to have you can't make the HOA do anything related Correct. to this. Correct. Right. If they don't then so they don't. They don't. Make that. Right. If they don't want to meet there's nothing more we can do. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I think it, it properly communicates our intention and our strong wish that this would happen. We're not conditioning this on any result. Of that meeting. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for so clarifying. That. The amendment made by Commissioner McDowell, seconded by Commissioner Stokes. Any more discussion on that? Let's vote, please. And that amendment passes four to one with Commissioner Emmerich dissenting. Do you want to comment on that? Absolutely. I don't think that is our purview to force them into a meeting. They need to meet on their own, on their own terms. And it's not up to this board to decide what they meet about and what for. That's, that's not what this procedure is about. This is quasi-judicial. They've met the requirements. We're going through that proceeding. And that's what it should be. We shouldn't put ands and ahs and this and that. It's it's just totally foolish, in my opinion. Okay. Let's go back to the original motion, um, and let's vote on the original motion. And the original motion carries four to one with Commissioner McDowell dissenting. Do you care to comment? I dissented, Mayor, because it does not, uh, it's not economically beneficial. It, that's part of our code. It is up to us to determine this. And barely an acre of mixed use on a 32 acre parcel does not meet the definitions outlined in the ULDC. Okay, thank you for that. Um, 
we've concluded this. Thank you all for your uh, forbearance and information. Uh, moving on to item F, DMP 22-084. Uh, this item is quasi-judicial. City Clerk, can you read the petition title and swear in those wishing to provide testimony? Consideration of petition number DMP-22-084, the Waters at Northport Development Master Plan. Can everyone wishing to provide testimony please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to provide is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? So help you God. I do. Thank you. It's time for ex parte disclosures. Commissioner Emmerich. No, ma'am. Vice Mayor White. Um, I'm sorry. Give me a second here. Um, Want me to come oh, back to no, you? No, I just had some conversations about the buffer. Okay, uh, none for me. And uh, Commissioner Stokes? Yeah, I just had some brief conversations about the buffer as well. That's all. Commissioner McDowell? Uh, yes, I requested a copy of the traffic impact st study, and also I had some questions regarding AMI and the county's contribution for this project. Okay. All of those emails were sent to the city clerk for the record. City clerk, are there any aggrieved parties for this item? Then let's move on to presentations. Applicant, you have 20 minutes. Good evening, Commission. I'm going to keep this short and sweet given the time. Um, we Stephen appreciate Somber, that. Banks Engineering, I've been sworn in. Um, uh, we're, we're proposing an affordable housing project that will consist of 288 units within 12 buildings. Uh, it'll have a clubhouse, um, amenity center, if you will as well as all associated infrastructure regarding stormwater and utilities. Um, they'll have access off of Pan American at an extension of Children's Way that we're proposing to extend to also give access to the adjacent city site that's being proposed. Um, the site is roughly 20 acres and is situated or zoned planned uh, community development as well as it's situated in the Activity Center 1, Mediterranean. So the project will meet the Urban Design Pattern Book uh, for Activity Center 1. Traffic statement or traffic impact statement was conducted in accordance with the Unified Land Development Code, um, but it will be left up to the city engineer for review. Uh, stormwater and environmental resource permit is currently being permitted through the Southwest Florida Water Management District. Thank you, sir. Staff? All right. Good evening again. For the record, Noah Fossick, Planning and Zoning Division. I have been sworn. Uh, we are now discussing DMP 22084. Again, this presentation will be divided into five parts. Um, I will give an overview of the project, um, show you the development master plan, the conceptual renderings, um, touch on compliance with local and state regulations, and give an analysis of the proposed development. Uh, the proposed development is located to the east of Pan American Boulevard, south of the 52nd addition to Port Charlotte subdivision west of Mayakahatchee Creek and north of the future Utilities Administration building. The site is part of Activity Center 1 and has a zoning of planned community development. The proposed development includes 288 residential units, all of which are intended as affordable and attainable units. The 288 residential units are being proposed in 12 24 unit buildings. Access to the site will be uh, via Children's Way um, from connecting to Pan American Boulevard. Uh, again, to the east of the property is Myakahatchee Creek, um, and stormwater is uh, predominantly on the uh, western and the southern portion of the property in two large stormwater ponds. 
The conceptual renderings for the two apartment building types are on the screen now. They're, they're largely similar um, with only slight differences in the massing. Uh, the clubhouse welcome center is now shown. Uh, this includes a, a pool, a mail kiosk, and uh, the laundry. The applicants did hold a neighborhood meeting virtually on February 13th. Uh, all the requisite documents are provided in your backup materials. That includes the agenda, the notice, and the minutes. A uh, legal ad was published in the Daily Sun on February 28th um, with the postcard mailers sent out uh, the same day to all the property owners within a quarter mile radius. Uh, the applicants requesting two modifications related to the setbacks and the buffers. Uh, the first modification request is for a 25 foot setback in lieu of a setback equal to two times the structure height. Uh, the modification would specifically allow buildings 5, 6, and 7 to be located 25 and 36 feet from the pr northern property line, respectively. Uh, the intent of the regulation uh, is to provide adequate buffering between the taller structures in the existing neighborhoods. However, to the north of the property uh, is already an existing 50-foot wide uh, drainage right away, uh, or drainage tract, and a city-owned open space tract to the north of that. Uh, that open space track varies in width, um, but ho however, it provides at minimum another 30 feet or so of, of buffering between the neighborhood to the north. Um, based on the width of these tracks, um, even with the reduced setback, the structures of this proposed development would still be farther from the existing neighborhood uh, than a similar development built to this regulation, uh, the two times the height of the structure, uh, that did not have any tracks buffering it from the existing neighborhood. So staff feels that there is the adequate distancing between the structures <coughs> in the existing neighborhood. Uh, that's actually beyond what would typically be there. Uh, the second modification requests a 22 or 20 foot buffer uh, in lieu of a 40 foot buffer. Uh, the modification again applies to the northern and the eastern property lines. Um, and that's the only two property lines where the buffer would normally apply. Um, the, uh, again, to the north of the property, there's already that significant buffering offered by those two, the drainage tract and the open space tract um, that are both owned by the city. Uh, to the east, there's the Mayak Hadji Creek, which provides a significant buffer um, that is in almost the entire portion of it, 800 feet or more in width. Um, and even on the um, other side of the Mayak Hatch Creek is just the right of way of Northport Boulevard before you get to any homes. Um, so their staff feels that there's significant buffering already in terms of the creek, the drainage right of way, and the open space tract uh, before there's any uh, neighborhood. Uh, so in some staff is supporting these two modifi not modification requests. Staff has also reviewed the development master plan for compliance with the comprehensive plan. Um, specifically, housing element policy nine states the city shall address the community's employment demands, workforce needs, and senior livability concerns by ensuring that a variety of housing choices are available for future and existing residents. Likewise, economic development policy 5.1.2 states that the city shall, shall seek to expand housing options that support the local workforce by planning for development near employment and transportation <coughs> centers. The proposed development is proposing 288 income restrictive units, ensuring that existing and future residents can afford to live within the city, uh, particularly in the wake of the current real estate and housing costs. Um, affordable housing is obviously a large concern of the state, the region, and the city. Um, with a critically low number of the current housing units in the city having any rent restrictions. Uh, the development would be a good step forward to meeting housing policy nine uh, by providing this affordable housing to the city's workforce and senior communities. The development is also conveniently located uh, nearby to the Trot Circle industrial area, adjacent to a nursing home, daycare, and the city's own social services division. Um, and the employment opportunities along US 41, which 
helps it meet economic development policy 5.1.2. Uh, the rest of staff's analysis, including all the goals, objectives, and policies listed on the slide can be found in the staff report. Staff also reviewed the development master plan for consistency with the Unified Land Development Code. Uh, the proposed development does include a mixture of uses as it's connected uh, with the development of the utilities administration building and also leaves a future commercial development tract um, at the southeast corner of Pan American Boulevard and Children's Way. Uh, the uses are also listed as permitted in sections 53-103 and section 5515. Uh, and the proposed development does provide all the requirements or request modifications of the PCD district found in 53.113, including the minimum 30% open space. Staff has also conducted a fiscal impact analysis, which showed a net benefit over the first five years of the project of $830,444. Last, the, uh, lastly, the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board heard their, this item at their March 16th meeting and voted unanimously to recommend approval. Uh, and based on the evidence presented to you today, staff is recommending that the City Commission approve DMP 22084. Thank you. You are welcome. Any rebuttal by the applicant? No, ma'am. Okay, staff, any rebuttal? Uh, staff has no rebuttal. Thank you. You are welcome. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any online or in-house public comment for this item? Yeah. And I'm opening up the floor to Commissioner questions. Commissioner McDowell. Yes, I'm curious. I didn't see anywhere in the staff report or hear anything about how long this development is going to be deemed affordable. There will be a land use development uh, uh, restriction. Uh, we would be entering into uh, that agreement not only with the city but the county and our lender. And if I think the lender's requirement is 30 years, I think the city's requirement is 15, and I think the county's 15. But going off the top of my head, that's not a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? State your name for the record. Oh, Tom McVeigh. Um, uh, I did swear. <laughs> okay. um, if you could put a picture back up of the development itself, um, the kind of the blueprint showing where the 12 buildings are. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm looking at this, and I am only seeing one point of ingress and egress. Could you show me where the secondary ingress, egress is for emergency or actual access? Absolutely. Uh, the secondary emergency access will actually be through the utilities administration building site to the south. Um, and that's already been um, negotiated and approved with the utilities department. And will that be full access or emergency only? It will be emergency, emergency. only. Thank you. And the waters at Northport, just to elaborate on that subject, is also the city's secondary access for their development of the maintenance facility. Oh, okay. Thank you. <coughs> um, so in the staff report on page five, there's a condition about a wetland. Where is the wetland on this map? I don't see a wetland. If you give me one moment to sure. pull that up. Could you repeat where that was located in the staff report? Um, page five is <coughs> under a condition. It's, it's a listed condition. I'll tell you what the condition number is. Uh, condition number three, please submit a survey delineating <coughs> the wetlands. And I'm asking, where is the wetland? So we, we the environmentalist biologist has done... Um, What's your name? Stephen Somber, Banks Engineering. I've been sworn. 
the environmentalist biologist Ian Vincent has um, submitted for a formal deter determination with the Southwest Florida Water Management District. There is a small, I don't know what the, what you would term it as, a junk wetland, if you will. It's not really functional up in the center of the site. And then there is a wetland that's along Children's Way that does not encroach into our property. It's actually on the southern portion, which I don't believe is part of the city property. I think it's an out parcel, but it does not touch our site. There is a small wetland that um, Southwest Florida Water Management District is currently working with the biologist to make a determination if we are going to impact. So if if the environmental people in Swift Mud say that this wetland is a wetland, will that change? No, ma'am. No, no, ma'am. We would we would one hundred percent impact it, and we would have to mitigate it in some way, whether that be through credits or however they handle that. Is there a okay. negotiation? Um, the fiscal analysis said something about the possibility that this is exempt from ad valorem. Could you please elaborate on what that means? Uh, that is correct. Um, within the Florida statutes, there's certain uh, property ad valorem tax exemptions for affordable housing developments. Um, that would be up to the developer to seek. Um, so at this point, we, we cannot ascertain whether or not that would impact the the tax revenue, um, and so the fiscal impact analysis was run under, their, under the assumption that there would be no property ad valorem tax exemptions, but there may be. Thank you. Mayor, that's all the questions I have. I do have a comment. Uh, Vice Mayor White. Yes, thank you. Uh, my questions are all pertaining to the um, buffering. Um, I just wanted to clarify if any of this development is what's considered zone three of the creek area? None of this development infringes on that protected area. Okay, thank you. Clarify that. Um, and then the, the setback normally would be 80 feet, correct? <coughs> the setback would be double the structure height, yes. Um, in this case, um, I believe they're simply labeled as three story. So the setback would be somewhere around 60 to 70 feet. Right. Um, and then I know you mentioned uh, something about, or maybe it's in here, about normally it's like neighborhoods and that's why you want that buffer. I consider the creek a very important neighbor. Okay, so I really would like to see that, that buffer to the east side um, in there. You also mentioned that you said it's buffered from other uses by the creek itself, which is over 800 feet in width. So is that including the creek itself? And that's including the land that's on the east side of the creek when you're take, talking about that 800 feet? Yes, when I mentioned the 800 feet, I'm referring to that tract of land at its width at the narrowest point is still 800 feet. That includes the the tr creek itself and also the land that uh, surrounds it and is part of that tract of land. Right, but that's not their land, correct? Correct. Yeah. That is actually owned by the city. That's right. Okay. It's, it's owned by the creek. Yes. I just want to clarify <laughs> yes, that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and then I, I'm looking at slide 25. All right. You have a nice, nice drawing there, and you show the creek, and then you show two linear sections before we get to the applicant's property. So that first section has like a, there's like a dotted dash line there. Um, I, I'm curious what the distances are in both of those segments there. Uh, you mentioned slide 25? Uh, yeah, there, you're right. You see we're on, I think that's 25. This line? No, it was the other okay. one. Okay. Yeah, you're showing the creek. All right. And then right to the left, there's there's an area, uh, like a buffer, and then you, you have like a, a dashed line right before the 
applicant's property. I'm just curious what those two widths are. Yes, I believe you're referring to the grading easement in okay. it's 75 feet. All right, so then let's just, so is that from the property line to the, the line that sh is showing as the creek on here? Is that 75 feet? So the 75 feet is the width of the grading easement. Um, so this uh, is the, that's the distance from this solid line, this property yes. line. To this dashed that. line. So that's and then a, even yeah. beyond that, this is the creek itself here. So the creek is beyond that 75 feet. Okay, so what I'm asking is you, you show that 75 feet that's right next to the, the property to the left. Yes. And then you have that other space. Yes, and additionally, you would still have the 20 foot buffer from the property. Okay, line. but if you go to the right, I'm sorry. Yes. Before the, but in front of the, uh, <laughs> yes, this area. That area, there, is that another? Is that included in the 75 feet or is that a That's beyond the 75 feet. So you know the creek itself is more than 75 feet from the property line. So the, the actual edge of the creek to that property line, if, if this is done to scale, it's 75 and 75 feet, would you say? That would be a rough estimate, but yes, all I could say with certainty is that it's greater than 75 feet. Okay. Um, can I ask it? Um, could I ask if there would be a problem? Why is there a problem in, in granting that eighty feet, that eighty foot buffer that we'd like to, that is in the code? So, based on the the proposed layout that we had, and given that there are adjacent tracks that are not developable. Um, as in a residential single family uh, home to the north side and to the east. And there is a 20 foot um, maintenance easement that is on our property for the, uh, the, the Myakahatchee. Um, we tried to maximize as much as we could and also allow the drive aisles and parking and everything and based on that footprint, plus trying to get our stormwater facilities and give the one acre plus or minus of stormwater facility to the city for them to do their site. That's that's kind of what our footprint laid out to. And so we are trying to maximize. Okay, and I, I, I appreciate that and I understand that, but it sounds like this project is using the buffer of the creek for your, for your buffer, so to speak. And instead of doing the 80 feet and requesting 25 feet, you're really using, utilizing. Well, I, I believe it's, if it, correct me, it's 40 feet buffer. Yes, I'd like to correct that. The buffer itself on that uh, eastern side abutting the creek is 40 feet. That setback that's twice the building height right. does not actually apply oh, to this buildings. property line it's only uh, because buildings. it only applies to peripheral property lines of the activity center. So it only applies to that northern property okay. line. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's very sure. mixed bag of what applies where here. Okay, so you, you're asking to go from 40 down to 20. That is correct, yes. Okay, well, thank, thanks for clarifying that. But the northern boundary, they're also asking. Yes, the buffer applies to both the northern property line and the eastern okay. property line. Right. The setback, though, only applies to the northern property line. Okay, all right. Um, yes, Commissioner Anders, I think I'm, I might all, oh, I'm all gone. gone. <laughs> gone. <laughs> Sorry. Goodbye. I, am, I just, I'm just really concerned about that. This is the jewel of Northport, this creek here, and we have great big plans for this, this area. We're having a, isn't that disc golf place yeah. going in there? And I really don't want people looking at big old buildings, uh, if we can help it. Um, all right, so you answered the question, Green but Lake Boulevard, where Greenway. Go, well, where this belt is. oh, okay, thank yeah. you, thank you. I, I have a couple of questions. Yes, do you want to collect yourself? No, I'm, I'm done. Back to you. I'm, thank you for okay. suggesting I collect myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have a lot of notes there. I like so. the way you put that. Yes, I'm good. Um, what are the target AMI percentages for this development? Yes, um, the uh, ownership group, Atlantic Housing Foundation, is uh, does all they do is affordable housing, 
and the waters at Northport will be developed under uh, Internal Revenue Service Red Rev Procedure 9632, which is safe harbor. It's a safe harbor structure uh, which permits the uh, 501c3 entity to have tax exempt bonds. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then, then to answer your question on the AMI levels under safe harbor rules, 20% uh, of the units are at 50% AMI or less. 55% of the units are at 80% AMI or less. And then you have 25% of the units that can be above 80%. Okay. So if you do a weighty, weighted average of AMI, that's at 79%. <clears throat> Okay, great. That was just what I was looking for. Um, what are the public transportation requirements for this development? Uh, Atlantic Housing really likes to have uh, public transportation in front of their mm -hmm. property. So it's my understanding that uh, there is a bus line right now on, no. Nope. County took it away. Yeah. Mm. That's why I, I asked. I'm almost done, Commissioner. Oh, I was going to piggyback. Sorry. Oh, it's it related? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Would the public transportation of having on demand fulfill the public transportation requirement? On demand is, a count, is the county's version of what used to be SCAT. All the resident has to do is pick up the phone, call, and they will pick him up at the door, take them to where they go in that zone, and then bring them back. That'd be great. Okay. I, I didn't want him walking away thinking there's no public transportation and it's going to kill the deal. Mm -hmm. That's why I wanted to piggyback off that. Thank you. I You're appreciate right. that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I apologize if this was covered and I missed it, but I'm seeing that development, you know, just to the west of the creek. What kind of buffering or protection is there to prevent children from wandering into the water? So we are providing um, a 10 foot, forgive me, a 10 foot, I believe it's a water, water buffer along that side. Yeah, what is a water waterway buffer? buffer? Excuse me, along that easterly side. Could you describe that for uh, me? It, it would be plantings, landscape plantings mm. that will be placed there. I mean, there won't, there wouldn't be a fence or or anything that would securely confine the the area leading up to the waterway. And to add on to that, Mayor, uh, there's nothing within well, the land sure. development code that requires so specific, um, you know, fences or whatnot to prevent children <laughs> or other people from wandering into the Maya Catchy Creek property. Right, but we're developing something there specifically that is going to contain lots of children, and I doubt if a child, a child drowned, that argument would hold up very long in court. So I'm a little concerned about that. Absolutely, and that would be a liability of potentially the developer. Mm -hmm. Typically, I, you know, I know it's not a requirement here, but typically Atlantic Housing does fence their properties. Okay. That's it for my questions. Um, do any of my fellow commissioners have any questions or comments on this project? Go ahead, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, I, I don't have any more questions, but I do have a comment. Um, you heard our conversation about the fencing for the previous one. That was more for security. This one is a request for safety. Um, children are, you, you, I don't need to explain to any of you how drawn to water children are. And I would sincerely hope that this is going to be considered in Bam. the greatest epic proportions to install some kind of physical barrier 
other than a, a brush that a child can sneak through, play and hide and go seek and go, oh, water, that's where I'm going to hide. Um, so that is a huge concern of mine. Um, the other part I would like to add is I do not want to be remiss in not mentioning Sarasota County's contribution to this project. $1.5 million is a lot of money and they invested in this project. And I, I personally am grateful and I'm sure my fellow commissioners share <coughs> that gratitude. And I wanted that on the record so that way then they may hear it and recognize that we recognize that. Um, just like the last development, this is no different. The, there's no mixed use in this and our PCD requires mixed use. However, each development is supposed to be judged on its own merits. So that development is different than this one. This one is specifically for affordable housing. And that benefit to the city cannot be overlooked. So I don't want people or anyone thinking, well, you said this about that one, but you're not saying it about this one. Each development is based on their own merits, or they should be based on their own merits. And um, having an affordable housing component, in my opinion, trumps everything. I just hope when you guys are doing your agreements, whatever those agreements look like, that the affordability aspect is going to exceed 30 years. If it goes to that 15 year point, that's not a very long time. And the need is not gonna change in 15 years. We're gonna just have to find another one to be an affordable housing complex. So I really hope that that would be taken under advisement to make it longer than, 50, than 30 years. Um, so with that, those are my comments and thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Staff, do you have any closing? <coughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Vice Mayor. Yeah, I just wanted to comment about the, the fence in the creek. I, I'm not, I, I'm good with your landscaping. Um, we have canals all throughout the city. People have the canals right in their own backyards, um, everywhere. Uh, what you do is your, your thing, but I, I don't, I'm not one who advocates that we should be afraid of the natural world. And I think it's, it's an amenity for people who end up living there that they have a creek. Uh, but they have to walk through, you said it was about 150 feet of woods. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we have a lot of people and children that fear the natural world. So I think that in itself is going to be a deterrent. Uh, but if they happen to explore the creek, I think that's, that's wonderful. So I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any closing arguments, staff? Yes. Um, just one note. Um, this development... Um, originated as one larger tract. Um, and we've sort of touched on this. Um, this affordable housing portion is just one of three parts of that original tract, um, which also includes the utilities administration building to the south, and also will leave behind a significant tract of land that can be developed for future non-residential uses, whatever that may be. Um, that would be a future developer coming in. Um, so staff does feel that this is a mixed use development with that con in consideration that it is part of a, a larger development that includes the utilities administration building and potential future non-residential development. Um, and with that, staff again um, is recommending approval. Thank you. Thank you. Applicant? No comments. Thank you for your time, Commissioner. You're welcome. I'm closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I'll make a motion, Mayor. Go ahead, Commissioner. I'll make a motion to approve DMP 22-084 with the following conditions outlined in the staff report, numbering 1 through 13, and waivers listed in the staff report, um, waivers 1 and 2 and that based on the competent substantial evidence, the DMP complies with the Unified Land Development Code. Do you have that recording, Secretary? To approve petition number DMP 22084 with the following conditions 1 through 13 and waivers 
one and two in the staff report and find that based on the competent substantial evidence, the developed master plan complies with the unified land development code. Thank you for that. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion on the floor as stated, made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by Commissioner Stokes. Is there anything more to that? Let's hope it's going to be built tomorrow and they can start taking applications today. <laughs> Let's vote. And that motion carries five to zero. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're looking Thank forward you. to that project. On to ordinances, second reading, ordinance number 2023-05. City Clerk, would you read this by title only, please? Ordinance number 2023-05, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the code of the City of Northport, Florida, section 7824U, pertaining to discontinuance and abandon of, abandonment of water, wastewater, and reclaimed water service. Providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for separability, providing for codification, and providing an effective date. Thank you, City Clerk, City Manager. This is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this second reading, as requested by the Commission, item is to address the utility customers uh, that were impacted by the hurricane and deferring their base charges for up to five years in order to allow them time to recover. Thank, Thank you, you for that. I'm opening the floor to Commission questions. I'm not seeing any. Moving on to public comment. Do we have any online or in-house city clerk? There is none. Thank you. I'm closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. Make a motion, Mayor. Go ahead, Commissioner. I make a motion to approve ordinance number 2023-5 as presented. Do I hear a second? Second. We have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by Commissioner Stokes to adopt ordinance number 2023-05 as presented. Anything to that? Let's vote. And that motion passes five to zero. We are almost at 10 o'clock. Let's take a 12 minute break and come back at 10.10.
It's 10 to 10, oh, and we yeah. are resuming um, the city commission regular meeting. Uh, we are on to ordinance number 2023-08. City clerk, would you read this by title only? Ordinance number 2023-08, an ordinance of the city of Northport, Florida, annexing, annexing approximately 1.1782 acres of real property located in the unincorporated area of Sarasota County, Florida, and continuous, contig contiguous to the existing city <laughs> limits of the city of Northport, Florida, redefining the boundary lines of the city of Northport to include this property, providing for findings, providing for annexation, amending the official zoning map, providing for assessment and taxation, providing for filing of documents, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an, an effective date. Thank you, City Clerk. Thank you. City Manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this is the second reading of the voluntary act annexation of the Baker property on North River Road, located near um, US 41. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. I am opening up the floor to commissioner questions. I'm not seeing any. City Clerk, do we have any public comment? We do not. Okay. Then I am closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I'll make a motion. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. I move to adopt ordinance number 2023-08 as presented. Terrific. Do I hear a second? Second. Commissioner oh. Emmerich, beat it to me. the punch. We have a motion on the floor to adopt ordinance number 2023-08 as presented. The motion maker is, um, who are you, Vice Mayor White? <laughs> Oh, oh, Commissioner oh, Emmerich my son is the second. Time. I'll tell you, I promise nothing after 10 o'clock. It's sketchy earlier than that. But Okay, so any discussion to that? Okay, I think we need to vote. And that motion passes five to zero. Moving right along to resolutions number 2023-R-17. A city clerk, would you read this item by title only, please? Resolution number 2023-R-17. A resolution of the city commission of the city of Northport, Florida, accepting ownership of donated real property located on Big New Road and described as lot 12, Block 2332, 47th edition to Port Charlotte subdivision. Sarasota County property appraiser parcel identification number 112-623-3212. Incorporating recitals, providing for filing of documents, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you, City Clerk. City Manager, you're up. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the owner, Richard Parsons, seeks to donate this vacant lot on Bigney Road to the city of Northport. Um, our assistant city manager, Jason Yarbrough, is here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I'm opening the floor up to commissioner oh. questions. I just had a question, quick question. I'm sorry. Vice Mayor, go ahead. When we get these donated parcels and they're not specifically for public works or something, uh, the, what department do they come fall under or they don't? They're just going to be... It'll be general city property, but typically it will be um, managed by the property management and public works. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I have one question. There's nothing nasty buried here. It's not a brownfield site. Jimmy Hoffa. Nothing like that. Jimmy <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 nothing. Fine. Nothing that we're aware of. There's a bunch of pirate treasure there. <laughs> Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. City Clerk, do we have any online or in-house public comment? We do, not. we do not. Well, I'm closing this public hearing and requesting a motion. I'll make a motion. Go ahead, Commissioner. Uh, right. Whoever you are. For my name. <laughs> Stokes. There's somebody on the pill for the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> she needs something. She needs something. I move to adopt resolution number 2023-R-17 as presented. Do I hear a second? Second. We have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner Stokes and seconded by Commissioner Emrich to adopt resolution number 2023-R-17 as presented. If there's nothing to that, let's... I have a question for Mr. 
Commissioner Stokes, did you say pillow or pill <laughs> for the mayor? Pill. Oh, okay. <laughs> That'll be a yes. A <laughs> <laughs> yes on the vote or a yes on the pill. Mm -hmm. And that motion passes five to zero. We're on a roll. Moving on to resolution 2023-R-28, City Clerk. Resolution number 2023-R-28, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the non-district budget and capital improvement budget for fiscal year 2022-2023 for salary benefits, operating and capital costs for nine new positions plus temporary staffing in the building division in the amount of... $1,655,400, providing for findings, providing for posting, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. City Manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a mid-year budget uh, amendment request to the Commission to approve for additional positions to reallocate existing building funds to absorb the expenditures. Um, the proposal does not impact the general fund at all. Um, the request is based on Northport being the second fastest growing city in our country, and this population is accompanied by a significant increase in both residential and non-residential construction. Uh, the division has experienced year-over-year -year increases in activity since 2017, uh, and the growth of the city will likely result in more record-breaking numbers again in 2023. Uh, the city's population has increased in an average growth rate over uh, a year from 2.23%. Uh, however, the current growth rate exceeds the average with an increase of 5.5%. Uh, in addition to putting um, stress on the current staffing levels, the division has incurred approximately $220,000 in overtime expenses over the last five fiscal years because of staff shortages. These positions will help offset any more of those costs as well as prepare for them more accordingly. The hurricane exacerbated the workload issue, but the city's population growth and building rate trajectory has been leading us to this inevitable point for several years, and the hurricane recovery only accelerated <coughs> the concerns. Uh, the deputy building official is one of the key positions I would like to point out, and this is due to the fact that we don't have one. We only currently have a building official, while other jurisdictions around us who are smaller in size do have this position. Uh, due to the importance of the role and the size of our city, it is critical that we add this position to our staffing right now to relieve some pressure off of our building officials. The hurricane uh, exposed some of our weakness in this area when it became necessary for the building official to assume the sole responsibility for reviewing damage assessments for those homes that were related, that were affected by the FEMA's 50% rule that we all recall. Uh, during that time, the building official was unable to do anything else but um, the most critical issues related to non-hurricane um, at that time. Additional costs are included in this request. I need to point out that we also have to procure six vehicles for the necessary field work related to the requested positions. Um, these vehicles would likely be trucks with four-wheel drive capabilities, and those approximate expenditures would be around $210,000. Uh, some additional costs for laptops, monitors, cell phones, et cetera, would also be included in this cost. Uh, the Capital Improvement Fund currently lists the Welland Park General Government Building Project with partially funding of building funds of approximately $1.6 million that is in question. Uh, we do believe that the proposed general government building should not be needed during the current CIP timeline. The city is currently conducting preliminary discussions with Welland Park regarding amendments to the post-annexation agreement. <laughs> And there's an understanding that the construction timeline of this facility could be renegotiated to a year beyond the current CIP horizon. Uh, approximately $1 million of this funding would be for salaries and benefits and the remainder um, and, and for vehicles, um, as I mentioned, and the equipment. But the remainder will be placed in budgetary line items to ensure sufficient funds for any uh, overtime that would be incurred, third-party building services and reserves. Um, as of March 1st, 2023, the building fund is on target to exceed $7 million for this year, um, which is um, far larger than the $5 million that was budgeted. Uh, but based on hurricane permit activity, annual revenues are going to continue in subsequent years due to the recent building fee increases and sustained permit activity for new development. Therefore, there is no budgetary shortage in subsequent years to maintain these requested positions. Um, 
myself, NDS leadership, city manager leadership, budget staff, everyone is here to answer any questions, even Donaldson, questions you might have regarding this approval, ma'am. Thank you for that, city manager. I'm opening the floor to commission questions. Commission, Commissioner Emmerich. Yeah, I've only got a couple of questions. These are for permanent, new permanent employees. It's not to seek like a organization out there to rent their employees to come in and help inspections like we did in the past. Correct. These would be new full-time employees for our NDS department. Okay. Well, that's it. That's all I had. Okay, Commissioner McDowell. Um, I have a few questions. Um, do we still utilize Skype or whatever online method for doing the more simple kind of inspections? Being Derek Algate, Assistant Director of NDS and Building Initial. Um, we do not currently have the those uh, those capabilities and technology available for us. We don't have a Skype that we do remote inspections on them. We do not. What happened to it? We, we never to. implemented it. I've been here for two years. We've never we've never implemented it. And it, just to be fair, the person who did attempt to implement it, it wasn't really something that the state supported at the time. They do it now. Um, it is not hugely successful. Sure, based on the the one-on-one -on -one and and understanding of how it worked and witnessing it, it sure looked like it was very beneficial, especially cost-effective. And I do not disagree. It looked it, it just it's like several things. It just it didn't end up doing as well as was projected. And it wasn't just Skype. It was other. There were other media yeah, that and, were, and were and doing I, it as well. But that was one of them. One of many. Yeah, and a few years ago, Skype was the thing, and who knows what it's called today. So that's right. why I said Skype-like. Um, you were talking about wanting a deputy building manager, but in the uh, resolution it says, and one building division manager. Is that going to bring it now to two building managers? We're, we're not asking for a building manager. We're asking for a deputy building official. Okay. So under the second page, after the word and... Second page of the resolution. resolution I apologize. <clears throat> Salary and benefit costs for nine positions, two development techs, six building plans inspectors, that, and one building division manager. Sorry, that should be one deputy building official. We'll have to get that is a, that is a scrivener's error. All right. Um, so. I know that you briefly touched on the post annexation agreement, but that post annexation agreement is in place until it gets amended. Um, and this money set aside, this $1.6 million, is for that general um, city building. And I am concerned about taking the money out of that without seeing what the post annexation amended agreement looks like. And I can't justify taking it out of that project when we have over $3 million <coughs> in fund balance. Uh, yes, ma'am. Jason Yarbrough, Assistant City Manager. Um, we've had a lot of discussions with Wellman Park. And right at this moment in time, we don't necessarily see a need for the construction of that general government building. Someday, absolutely. Do we want to provide um, services to that community when it's, you know, uh, projected to be a build out of 50,000, absolutely. But this time, there's more of a need to provide the inspection services than the need for that building. And um, with the rate of revenue coming in <coughs> above projections for the building department, I don't think it will take very long for us to get to get the funds to do what we need to do out there in Welland Park. Can I, can I add? Yeah, let, me, let me add something to that. Um, we put most of that money from the building fund into that CIP, I believe, last year. Yeah. The, yeah. We're statutorily required to spend that money in four, within four years of placing it in a CIP project if, we, if we're using building fund money. We have to spend that building fund money within four years, or we need to take it out and spend that money on something else. 
<laughs> um, we don't have any projections of, or even plans to spend that money within that timeline. We would need to spend that money within the next just over two years, uh, the building fund portion of that money. Is, is this something that can be discussed during budget time as opposed to taking? Well, we have the money. It's in the building fund. So it's not like we have to make a decision to use the CIP money until we figure out what the post annexation agreement looks like. We figure out what budget looks like. Why not just use the fund balance, leave this alone until we get all of the other ducks in a row? That's something that the commission could consider. We were looking at taking it out of uh, this in the couple of reasons. One, if we had another hurricane, um, and needed to dip into fund balance, or um, since we knew we were in the talks with the Welland Park developers and there were no projections that in any scenario that we can come up with that we would be able to spend that money within the next two years before our clock runs out on the building fund money, um, then we saw it as a way to uh, cover these costs without having to dip into any other funds. And just one more quick point on that. I know that when we had an excessive amount in the building fund before, we had to figure out how to spend it down really quickly. And that was one of the reasons that we reduced the building permitting fees. We just raised those fees. And th this sounds like we're going to be right back where we were. So we we would say that no, we do not need to raise the building fees. What we need no, to do to reduce. I'm sorry, we do we will not need to reduce the building fees. What we need to do is adjust our staffing levels to accommodate the additional development, and that will help us spend down that money. Um, additionally, some of it. <laughs> additionally, um, this department is out of room, and we do need uh, money to remodel the first floor if the if the building division is going to stay in this building um, we're, we're going to be putting people on top of each other and uh, so the intent was for some of that that I believe it was about seven hundred thirty dollars that would be seven hundred thirty thousand dollars that would be returned to fund balance we would likely be including some of that in this next budget year as a request for uh, remodeling for the first floor we have money already budgeted for remodeling the we actually we don't have anything in the fund right now it's currently unfunded it's the project is listed in the cip with future funding uh but there's no current funding in there i'll yield mayor okay, thank you commissioner um director ray how easy are these kinds of positions to fill um, they can be difficult to fill. Um, you have to, it depends on the timing, to be honest. We had a position, actually two positions that were mm -hmm. vacant for a while. Um, they were both filled at the same time just recently. We now have no positions available at all. Um, we, all of our positions in our department have been filled. I know the vacancy reports showed that there were two positions that were available. Those are no longer available. We have filled those. Um, so I believe that report was run at some point in February, and I'm, I don't have the date of that. Um, but after that data was pulled for that last February vacancy report, we did fill both of those positions. Um, additionally, um, we are getting interest from qualified people. Um, so I, I think that we will have better luck than we had in the past. Um, when there's talent there, there's talent there. And if you don't have a position open for it, then you don't get you the miss, talent. You miss the window. You do. Yeah, my reason for asking the question is doing the budget amendment now uh, enables us to take action now, whereas if we wait for the traditional budget cycle, we're not starting to recruit until Correct, and we are, we are actively recruiting. We're not, we're not putting a, an ad out on the you know, BOAF or, or the website and just waiting for them to come to us. We are using every contact we have to call people, bug them, <laughs> ask them if they would like to come to Northport. So poach. So you steal them. We absolutely do. <laughs> the, the, the bottom line is, is that we can't run our staff. They're at burnout right now. Right. Mm -hmm. We can't yes, do it anymore. They are. We, yep. We've hit a wall. Yep. I get it. 
Commissioner Stokes. Yeah, I don't have a question, but but definitely a statement. I mean, it, it is abundantly clear to everybody that this department needs additional staffing and it needs it like yesterday. And, you know, it, I mean, the sooner we do this, the better, in my opinion. I mean, to wait till budget just pushes this off way too far. There's no reason why we can't use this money. We're not going to be building anything in Welland Park for a while, it looks like. And, uh, you know, I see no reason. This is a good idea. It doesn't come out of the general fund. It's going to do the trick for us. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah. Um, you know, we got a lot of emails from a lot of developers. And I recognize that we need to beef up the staffing levels. And, and we need to do it now. We needed to probably do it three months ago when the hurricane hit. Hindsight is, is a marvelous teacher. Um, but we can't lose sight that we also have budgeted money and approved money for online permitting, which was touted as a um, efficient method and to help save staff grief and aggravation and ultimately not need so much staff. That has not been brought to us. It's been over a year since we made that budget amendment. That contract is still out in limbo. I don't know when that's going to be brought to us. I don't know how long. It, the Do email said question, I'm getting to it. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> the implementation is going to take about 18 months. So I think now would be a very good time to share with the developers out there the other side of the coin as to why we are where we are. Um, if we had these tools in place, we may not need nine. We might have only needed six. I don't know. So, so I can't please. address that. Uh, the contract... For Acela, which is our chosen, our selected uh, software provider, will be coming to the commission for approval next month in April. Okay. Um, <coughs> we have had a project manager. We had to find a, uh, determine which uh, company. We knew we probably wanted Acela because they're used by a lot of our surrounding jurisdictions. Our contractors are familiar with it. Um, we had to locate a, a contract, a government contract, that would be suitable for us to um, be able to utilize, and our purchasing uh, team worked with us to find that. Then we had to go through those uh, that coordination, so we're finally ready to bring you the contract. Uh, it will take about 18 to 24 months to um, implement that. Acela believes that they can get us uh, online and live by the end of next year. However, I will say that <clears throat> if we had a seller today, if we had been able to implement a seller last year, I don't think it would reduce the number of staff that we need. A seller cannot do inspections for us. That involves people in their trucks, out on properties, doing inspections. Um, I've worked with a seller. I've worked with a lot of the the a seller like programs, and it won't reduce our it won't reduce Fair our point. staffing level. Fair point. Yeah. It, if anything. Currently, when a permit comes in, our permit techs are, they have people in front of them all day long. They have to process those permits in order to get them in front of a plan reviewer. If anything, it will speed up that process to get things in front of a plan reviewer faster. Currently, it can take a week from the time someone brings us a permit and we hand it off to a plans reviewer. So hopefully it will speed that up. City manager. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I was going to point out that the the title block has been revised in the last couple of days, and I wanted to get the clerk's guidance on how to make sure that we have the right title block that we read into the record. It it changed to add a return to fund balance in the near the end. Oh, because the there was a. This was, so was a question and a change, but the but the title of the actual item didn't change to reflect it on the actual agenda page. Mayor, I can just read the correct title into the title block. Why don't we do that? Yeah. Okay. 
Resolution number 2023-R-28, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the non-district budget and capital improvement budget for fiscal year 2022-2023 for salary, benefits, operating, and capital costs for nine new positions plus temporary staffing and a return to fund balance in the building division in the amount of $1,655,400 providing for findings, providing for postings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you for that, City Clerk. Uh, Commissioner Emmerich. Yeah, I'm ready to make a motion if you are, Mayor. Well, let's do some public commenting first, and then I will go back to you, City Clerk. Sure enough. Okay, you hit it. Commissioner Emmerich. All right, I, am, I move to adopt resolution number 2023-R-28 as presented with changing the Scribner error of building manager to deputy building official. Is that what you wanted? Okay. Second. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to adopt resolution number 2023-R-28. Um, modifying, can you repeat that, the title? Yeah, changing the Scribner error of building manager to deputy building official. Official. Thank you very much for that. <coughs> Anything? Okay. A motion made by uh, Commissioner Emmerich. Did I hear a second? You did. Commissioner Stokes, is there anything to that? Then let's vote. And that motion passes five to zero. On to general. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, Madam Mayor, um, at this time, I, I do want to recognize Mr. Derek Applegate, our current building official. He is uh, leaving us, and I've been here for a year and a half, and I know he's been here for much longer, but he has done phenomenal work in his time here, not only through the, you know, the pandemic and other things that happened before my arrival, but during the hurricane, he was especially one of the people that we leaned on, our community leaned on. He became a household name, so to speak. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not for the reasons he may have uh, dreamed of, but you know, he was, he provides a high level of service and professionalism and he's always responsible and accountable. And we want to thank him for his service and we wish him well. And he knows that he can always call and go support for whatever he needs because home is always home. So we appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Good luck to you. Thank you. He is well, now you have one open position. Now we do. <laughs> we, we actually don't. I've already hired his replacement. There you go. Very good. <laughs> yeah. No, why not? <laughs> good luck to you, Derek. Good job. Yeah. Okay, on to general business. Item number 23-0453, discussion and possible action regarding the city Clerk's annual um, evaluation. City Manager, you're introducing this one? I am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so this item in front of you now is to recognize uh, all the hard work and leadership our city clerk does to her team each and every day all year long. All righty. Opening up the floor <laughs> to commissioner questions or comments. No one. Oh. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, I just want to say, I think you're doing a fantastic job in your department. I, I have watched you from being deputy city clerk to a new clerk in an office that was kind of on the brink of mutiny, and you changed it around, and I have enjoyed watching that transformation. Um, and I just wanted to say kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Commissioner McDowell. I think we all feel that way. Um, Vice Mayor White. Yes, um, I really enjoyed reading your self-evaluation. Um, it was very, very exacting and, and coincides, especially in your number nine there when you said you, um, you realize your style is more focused on accomplishing tasks. I can relate to that, okay, <laughs> rather than having meetings because I was always at fault for that. Like, I don't want to socialize. Let's just get the stuff done. So yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm that way. <laughs> so I really, I really enjoyed that. And um, yeah, uh, you've just been really, really good. And I do, I do um, um, want, uh, want to acknowledge that, yes, I've seen you opening up more and interjecting when, when we, 
we were kind of struggling up here and, and you're offering assistance, which is great. And I've seen that really improve throughout, throughout the year because you're, you are the one to know about the proceedings and, and what has to go down. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Commissioner Emmerich. You weren't saying that because of all the help you needed in your first year. I know. Was it? I know. No, that's why I did. Yeah. No, all I wanted to do was say thank you for everything that you do do. You know, your staff loves you. You've got a hold of that department. Like another commissioner said in the past, it has never been a smooth sailing machine. And I think today it has come a long way. And it is because of you and your leadership. And being able to just talk to you and ask questions, you're open at any given time. So thank you very much for your dedication and your work ethics. They are very much appreciated. Thank you. Commissioner Stokes. I'll echo my fellow commissioners and have to say, you know, being newly elected and trying to navigate my way through, not just since I've been elected, but before I got elected, I want to thank you for keeping me out of trouble, guiding me, and helping me through. So you do a great job. Your department does a great job. So thank you. Thank you much. You know, and I particularly appreciate your ability to keep me on the rails, which I demonstrate time and time again is no easy task. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much for that. Um, Mayor, I'll make a motion. Uh, let's go to public comment first. Does anyone want to talk about you, city manager? I mean, city clerk. city clerk. <laughs> what a promotion. That's a nice promotion. No, there is no public comment. Okay, great. Go ahead, Commissioner. Um, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion and see how it flies. Um, since we didn't discuss any salary increases, I'll start it by making a motion to um, increase the city clerk's annual salary by four and a half percent retroactive to her anniversary effective date of March 24th, 2023. Okay. We have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner McDowell to conclude the annual evaluation for City Clerk Heather Faust and give her a 4.5% salary increase retroactive to her start date um, of March 24th. Do I have a second? Actually, Mayor, it's her anniversary effective date. And I think there's a distinct difference because her start date is different than... So that's why I use the terminology anniversary effective date. Okay, modify that anniversary effective date. Do I have a second? I'm gonna second for discussion. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Emmerich. As, as I agree, um, <clears throat> she does a phenomenal job. I, I just think that it needs to be at a 5% which is pretty much status quo on what we've done with all of our other charter officers. Do you want to make that an amendment? Well, this is the discussion part, so. And I, oh, Mr. Stokes uh, wants to Stokes. speak. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I see no reason <laughs> that this shouldn't be a 5% increase. I mean, she deserves every bit of it. Vice Mayor? Yeah, 5% is what I had numerically, mathematically, that's what it kind of works out. I looked at all of our evaluations, and it's, that's about what it worked out to be. So thank you for suggesting that. Yeah, I, on the back of the cocktail napkin, had a 5% um, on that as well. I'm sure Commissioner Emmerich, you can relate to that. Yeah, how many cocktails? <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> uh, Commissioner McDowell. If, if the seconder would like to pull his second, I'll, I'll change the motion to reflect that 5%. You okay with that? Oh, yeah, I will pull. I, I was going conservative because I didn't know what the will of the board was. I actually was thinking of a 5%. But you were uh, very, very close. I, yeah. I was being more conservative. I didn't want to, you know. So um, I make a motion to um, instruct the salary increase to be 5% for the city clerk 
retroactive to her anniversary effective date of March 24th, 2023. And I'll be delighted to second it. Okay. We have a motion on the floor made by Commissioner McDowell to uh, give city clerk a 5% salary increase retroactive to her effective, her anniversary effective date of March 24th. Anything to that? I think it's time to Thank vote. you for the conversation. Yeah, and thanks for stealing my second, Derek Stokes. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure. You have to be quick around here. And that motion passes five to zero. Congratulations, city clerk. Thank you, keep up a good job. Moving on to 23-0594. Um, city manager, this is your item to introduce. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this is 23-0594, uh, discussion and possible action to supplement the cost for project graduation to use the Aquatic Center. And this item was submitted by Commissioner McDowell. Would you like to talk to that, Commissioner? Yeah, I just, um, project graduation is, is an event that's held every year for as long as I can remember since my kids have gone to high school. Um, it is a very worthwhile, safe, environment for the graduates to attend. Um, they're having a little bit of a shortfall, and I think a lot of that has to do with Hurricane Ian. A lot of businesses are recovering, families are recovering, the donations just aren't coming through, and they're, they've raised a lot of money. They have shown a good faith effort in their fundraising campaign, but as of the time I posted this agenda item, they were about $850 short. Um, I, I'm hopeful that that has already come through, um, but at the same time, I don't wanna take that chance because graduation is, is quickly approaching. And I thought, you know, we have a contingency fund and if anything <coughs> can be used for a contingency fund, this might be one of those areas. Um, I'd also kind of like to get an update about the vehicle donation. The last I heard, they still hadn't found a vehicle to donate. Um, and also uh, a final thing that I was wondering is the, um, <clears throat> and I just lost it. There was a, a second thing. Hmm. Welcome to my world. <laughs> we'll blame oh, it on boy. being quarter to 11 and past my bedtime. <laughs> so I will yield and hopefully it'll come to me. <laughs> um, and, cool. City manager. Sorry, Madam Mayor. When we, we are still looking for the vehicle to donate as Commissioner McDowell just requested an update on. When we find it, which I'm, I think our team is fairly certain we will, we'll send an email or a memo out to all of the commission alerting you of the dip. Thank you discovery. for that. Yeah, and it, once that is discovered, the commission has to approve it um, because it's surplus. And the, the part that I had forgotten about was, does anybody know if project graduation is also open to Imagine High School graduates? Um, I don't think so. I, I don't know. Elaine would know, but I don't okay. know. I'll reach out to her. I just thought maybe somebody up here knew. So um, thank you. Okay, Vice Mayor White. Yes, um, and, and thank you for bringing this up, Commissioner, um, that uh, we could use our contingency fund. I think that's a great idea to support what they're doing, but I also would like to challenge the business community out there to uh, um, to uh, support our graduates every year, because I think in project graduation has had some tough times through the years that sometimes it's actually almost dissolved uh, because they didn't have enough even parental support um, to do to do this and uh, there's really no reason for that um, and um, but I'm all for us um, putting in the difference and making this happen for them thank you thank you for that Commissioner Emmerich yeah this is probably a question for Miss Bunfeller if she could approach the bench please <laughs> Swear to tell the whole truth. No, <laughs> now, where where are they at with their funds that they have raised? Are they still short the eight fifty, or have they? 
uh, the note I got was that they have a balance of 956. And what do they need? That's that's that what that's that's what's left to pay, that's 956. A that's a shortfall. So they're still short. Even if we give the 850, they're still short at that point. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. Then go ahead. Mayor, go ahead. Um, that $956 includes a $100 security deposit that they will get back. That's why I wasn't counting that. Is that correct? Am I reading your receipt correctly? Uh, there should be a $100 deposit, correct. Do you want yes. to see the receipt? Yes, that was that had to be paid as part of it. So, yes, yes you're correct. Okay, so, so $856 is what is still remaining. I no, they still have to pay the hundred, and then it comes oh, back afterwards. That's been paid. I have the nine fifty six on my sheet. Okay. That's what they owe. That's what I have. Okay. okay. No, that's what I'm asking. Maybe because, a not to exceed would break well, us through here. Well, what I was getting at is, is if if they had, because she had mentioned that they may have gotten more money since then, and if we donated the eight fifty. Could they have used the excess to just keep and maybe buy pizzas or whatever if we committed to the 850? But now that we're a little short with that 850, I want to make sure that they're whole. Mm -hmm. So could we, like, and this is between the board, I would like to say that we take it to the $1,000 not to exceed. Mm -hmm. And then this way everything's covered. And then when the security deposit comes back or whatever, either they can have possession for it for next year or put it back into our account, Which, whichever way it works. These are our kids. These are our future. I just want to make sure they're whole and, and be done with it and the bill's paid. Understood. Yeah. Commissioner McDowell? Yeah. I, I was just looking at they paid the deposit when the event is over and everything is cleaned up and ready to go. They get their deposit back. That's why I was focusing on the 850. Because this is taxpayer money, we're, we're trying to be helpful. This is not something that I hope that they're not going to need every single year. I think given the constraints of the hurricane, that's why they're a little bit shorter. Um, I, I don't know if we should go to the not to exceed 1,000. They've already got, they have 950 minus that $100 deduct, uh, deductible <laughs> deposit. So... But whatever the numbers come out, if it's 900, it's 900. If it's 850, it's 850. If they get more money in, we're just making them whole up to $1,000. And these are taxpayers' children. Right. No, I guess so that. it's still. I, that's why I this forward. It, yeah, it's still. <laughs> no, I know. And it's still their money. And I, and I don't think it's a high price to pay. Right. I'm not going to squabble. That's why I'm over, having this dialogue. I'm not squabbling over 100 or $150. Right. And I didn't think anybody would up here. I just wanted to make sure that they were whole and they don't have to worry about their graduation. It's done, signed, sealed, delivered. We're good. Well, I'm sensing a motion is imminent, but before we do that, City Clerk, do we have any public comment on this item? Okay. Who wants to take it away? I'll make a motion, Mayor. Go ahead, Commissioner. I'll make a motion to instruct a uh, city manager to use the commission's contingency fund not to exceed $1,000 for a project graduation 2023 to use the aquatic center facility. Second. Okay. okay. Um, recording, Secretary, you want to read that back to us? to approve the use of the commission's contingency fund, not to exceed $1,000 of the shortfall of the rental cost of the aquatic center for project graduation 2023. Okay. Motion maker is Commissioner McDowell, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. If there's nothing more to that, let's vote, please. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. <laughs> And the motion <coughs> passes five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 23-0592, city manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this item is discussion of possible action regarding the implementation of Warm Middle Springs 
Park soft reopening event. Uh, thankfully and patiently, we are at the final stretch here of opening up War Middle Springs. First of all, let me thank Director Funheller and her team and everything that they've done to get it prepared and us to this point. Thanks to the people of uh, Northport for being patient and um, bearing with us as we get here. This week, the electrician has um, been work to finish, done work to been finishing up the connections that we need. Um, the plumber has been doing work on site. We've also uh, we'll be having some concrete board next Monday that will allow for the ADA compliance to be met. And in that um, spirit of opening and soft opening next week, we want the flexibility to have the, uh, the chance to allow for uh, at least two days where we would open the springs without charging our um, community because they deserve it but we also want to just make sure that we recognize them for their patients. But this item will allow that to happen as we cannot wait be due to the fact they are codified. So we are looking for your approval as we get ready for that event and moving Warm Middle Springs to the next phase. Thank you for that, city manager. Um, I'm opening up the floor to commissioner questions or comments. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, so two days is going to represent the soft opening? Is it open during normal business hours or is it shortened hours? What does the hours of operation look like for that? I would hope that we're open regular hours, um, but if we're not ready to go, we want to open whatever hours we can working around the contractor's schedule. So we're looking for flexibility. All right, with that answer, I would be amenable to making it seven days. The, the, the springs have been closed for six months. It's a very long time. It's been a very tumultuous time for a lot of the residents, as we remember from public comment. And I believe there's money in their fund to accommodate seven days, especially if it's only going to be, you know, maybe a few hours on a few of the days and then regular operating hours on a few of the days. I don't know that. If right. we are ready to open, we, we're going to open 9 to 5 regular hours. So I, I don't want to tell you that Seven days there's going to be still... you know, one day of, of shortened hours and then the rest may be full days. Mm -hmm. So um, it could be we're ready to go on Friday with 9 to 5 um, regular hours. I'm still hoping we can find a happy compromise, but two days just doesn't seem adequate to give no charge for admission. Commissioner Emmerich. <clears throat> yeah, when I had discussed this with the city manager in my one-on-one, -on -one, it was possible that you were going to be doing it in the evenings after some work time to where it would only be a few hours. Yes, would, sir. That, yeah, it, would not be me, it would not be evenings. Um, it would be probably like a, a 4.30 to 7.30. Right. Before, that's, that's yeah. what he, to me, that's evening. Okay. Night is after the sun goes down. <laughs> so that's evening. And happy hour, all in one motel. All together. But uh, if it was to be that, then we are only talking a few hours, maybe three. And I would be viable to do it like for a whole week long if it was at, at those hours. And then possibly, let's say the... We did that all week long, and then the following Saturday and Sunday was the all-day hours to where you're still getting mm -hmm. some time going in there. I don't know if you can plan when they're going to be done or when they can, when you could do the afternoons going into the full days, but I would be, you know, I would do that. I, I can't see going all week long from dusk to dawn, you know, or from dawn to dusk. And... Um, Commissioner Emmerich, just to clear that up, the the evening hours of 4 to 7.30 were based on the fact that the electrician was still doing work on site, so they would work from like 7 until 4 p.m., and then that's when the possibility came because we wanted to make sure that if they're still doing their work, you know, worst case scenario, up until the date of the 7th, we are opening on the 7th, and then it would be in that abbreviated fashion, which is what led to that conversation of a evening short hours. Well, then, then the way that I would be looking at it then is if you got the date of the 7th mm -hmm. and you're opening up on abbreviated hours, then give it to them in the abbreviated hours for free mm -hmm. 
until they could have two full days, like on a Saturday and Sunday, at the Springs complimentary. That's the way I'm looking at it. It's, this way it gives a lot of different opportunities for different people to be able to get there. Correct. Yes. We that's, were, that's the way I'm looking at we it. We were thinking the same thing. Vice Mayor White. Yes, uh, and this would be free for anyone, no matter where they live. Correct. Okay. And is there a limit to how many people can pass through that gate or be in the lake at one time? Is there actually um, a limit for that? Uh, there aren't any more. There's not a, a maximum bathing limit that, that was removed that's no longer um, required for spaces such as warm mineral springs and natural body of water. Um, but from an operating standpoint, um, we would end up putting a limit on it if, if it was at a point where we felt it was not safe. Okay. <coughs> um, all right. And I'm, I'm just assuming people come come in the morning, they could just stay all day if they wanted to, correct? I'm sorry, I can hear if, you. If they came in the morning, is that what we're, we're saying? It would be open during the day, right? We're trying to open no later than, absolutely no later than the 7th, but on the 7th, we want that to be a regular day. Nine to, we're opening right. nine to five regular hours. So if people came first thing in the morning, they could stay they all could day. They could stay all day. Right. Okay. Most, most people on average are staying about four hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. What day of the week is the 7th? Friday. Okay. Perfect. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, so just for clarity, bear with me. <laughs> so we are not going to be open regardless of abbreviated hours or full-time hours up until the 7th. I don't, I don't know don't. that. We have some things that are hinging on the contractor finishing the work and FPL activating electrical service. Um, we have all the staff on board. We're finishing up the waterfront training um, at the beginning of the week. Um, we've got all the equipment. Um, things are coming together, but I, I just don't have a, a definite date. Okay. We have to have those ADA walkways in um, and ready to go so that public has access um, from the parking lot, you know, from the admissions to the spring and um, to the restroom trailer. So based on what you're saying, between now and the 7th, mm -hmm. it is unlikely it is going to be open for even abbreviated hours or full-time hours. I don't know that. Okay. We're, we're <laughs> pushing, and I'm pushing staff, and we're all trying to be as ready as we can be to pull the trigger and open up as soon as we can. Okay. City manager? <clears throat> I, I think what we've said and what we're saying is we don't have all the details of when exactly it will open. We would love to open it up before Friday the 7th, irregardless of whether it opens up Friday the 7th or Wednesday the 5th. We want to allow the public to come in there for free given the time that it's been closed. We don't want you to pigeonhole us into what that looks like today because we don't know that today. So we would like to, for you to give us a little bit of flexibility in order to just follow the direction of making sure that the public can use the springs free of charge multiple days due to the length of time that it's been closed. And we as staff will figure that out as the operations becomes more clear to all of us. Excellent. And I think I was hearing that you wanted direction on how to open and give the okay to open for free. So I appreciate that clarity. Um, you do realize that that's Easter weekend and a lot of the users may or may not be there. Is it going to be open Easter Sunday? Yes. Okay. It's open every day except Christmas. Okay. Just wanted to answer, ask that. Thank you. Commissioner Emmerich. Yeah. Um, I understand what you're trying to get at, city manager. If you can open it up as early as possible, that's what we were saying the same thing. If you're going to open it up on Wednesday yes. prior to the 7th, mm -hmm. then Wednesday at limited hours or whatever the case may be, you do that free Correct. of charge. Then on the 7th, 8th and 9th, now it's a three-day weekend, and then Monday it's back to regular business. They could have three free days or in two evenings. That's fine with us. You know, that's what we're saying. We, we have to work with your schedule, but I think this board is very amiable with what you want to do on your timeline. Just know that, you know, we're good with it, you know. Thank you. 
Okay. If we have a motion and all that good stuff to go with it, there, Mayor. But yeah, yeah, I'm not seeing any more um, lights on. So, City Clerk, do we have any online or in-person public comment? Yes, we do. Susan Gastoni. Upon taking my 30-day pass to Warm Mineral Springs for conversion to a plastic card with my remaining days on it, I was informed that there would be no more passes issued until the P3 plan is decided upon. This is very concerning to me and many other spring patrons and would curtail our use of the spring significantly. As a Sarasota County resident who is retired and on fixed income, the cost of using the spring without a pass discount would prohibit me from using it. I'm sure this is true for many others as well. I would like to suggest that you issue 30-day passes with the stipulation that they must be used within a 60-day time frame or some time frame that you are comfortable with, given the transitionary circumstance, circumstances with regard to possible development. It has already been difficult for those of us who have had to wait many months for reopening, especially when the park concessioners were willing to open it in a very short period of time. Now, on top of this delay, we are being asked to pay $15 a day when we were currently paying $5 a day with a 30-day pass. It is an unnecessary burden placed upon us in addition to the long wait time for reopening. My other concern is the lack of work being done at the spring to ready it for the upcoming opening date. Many of the patrons have driven by and examined it through the gates, only to observe that it is in disarray, but no one working on the premises. This is very discouraging to see. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> City Clerk, Commissioner McDowell. Um, in light of that public comment, is that accurate? We are not going to be issuing passes? Our intent was not to issue any new passes. We are taking existing passes. We're transferring them to our system um, with the recreation software that we use um, for the visits that are remaining um, and extending them the number of days that we were closed, which is 191, um, based on the April 7th date. Um, but we are not intending on selling any passes. They, the passes are good for a year. Um, if we do that, um, we're going to be back in the same boat. If we end up going with a, a partner that may take over the operations, we'd have to refund, again, all those passes, the same process that we're going through now. Um, so we were not intending to do that because it's a very, our intent is that this is a temporary situation, that we're operating the, the springs. Um, and that's how we've hired the staff as well under a temporary status. I, I didn't know that there was no intention of selling passes and that, that's concerning to me. I mean, a lot of the residents use these passes. So why can't we just issue like 14 day passes and, and not have it good for a year, have it good for you know, 30 days, those 14 day patent settlement, 14 day increments. Um, I understand that we don't know what the agreement looks like, but at the same time, this is not something that's going to be done in the next, I guess, two months or three months or so. Why can't we find a different workaround? City manager. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we would ask that as we chose not to issue new passes based on the reasons that the director said that you allow us the flexibility to make sure that we put in a system that works well for us to manage, keep track of, and can make accurate purchases and provide accurate services to the um, public without putting an arbitrary limit on it today, on this day. Oh, and I, I recognize that. I just am looking for some kind of an amenable compromise to no passes versus some kind of passes and whatever that looks like, I would hope it's going to come back to commission for discussion and, and a blessing. Director, what's the difference in price if you fly on a daily basis versus an annual pass? If you break it out, what's the delta? I, I don't have annual pass. Daily <clears throat> fee is um, 15 for uh, residents and 20 for non-residents. Okay. But Mayor, yes. just want to say that we're here for the soft yeah. opening and yeah. not the passes. Yeah. That should be on another agenda item. Right, right. Okay. Um, <coughs> we've done public comment. I am looking for a motion. I'll make a motion, Mayor. Go ahead, Commissioner. I'll make a motion to um, give the city manager the latitude of a soft opening to Warm Mineral Springs allowing five total free days 
of um, access to the springs for the users, regardless of operating hours. I'm going to second for discussion. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Can you repeat that, Commissioner? Oh, I'll do my best. I, I believe I have it. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Recording He's Secretary. Now. He's got. Well, don't. <laughs> don't don't give me credit Let's yet. Hear it first. <laughs> right. Uh, to give the city manager the latitude of a soft opening to Warm Mineral Springs, allowing five total free days of access to the springs for the users, regardless of operating hours. Good. Motion maker, Commissioner McDowell, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. I for discussion, believe. I have a question. For discussion, go ahead. With the five days. This is where it gets a little sticky because if you do it on limited hours, let's say for two of those days, are you still going to have to make up eight hours or whatever the case may be to keep equal five days? So if it's five days variable hours, that would be a little bit different than five days total because you're talking 40 hours compared to if you're only doing four hours in the evening, three days, and then that's 12, and then you got 16, that's only 28 hours. I, I understood <laughs> the motion to give staff the flexibility I just want to, to figure it out. I just Thank want you. to clarify, that's all. Regardless of the operating hours was the last part right. of that motion. So if the operating hours are from 4.30 to 7.30, that's day one. Okay, if that's all I wanted to know. Okay. Is from three o'clock until seven thirty. That's day two. We got it. So because I just enough. don't want the patrons to come back and say, "No, you owe me four hours because I was only here for four right. hours last night." Because it will happen. I'm sure it will. But you know what? No matter what we do, it's going to happen. So, right. So as long as it's clear, they get five days, no matter what the hours are. Free access. Whatever. Of okay. the operating hours. Up to okay. them. Vice Mayor. I just had a question about that very last sentence. It says past visits will not be deducted from valid pass holders. So we have to put that in the motion, How, whatever that, I don't even know what that means. If it's free, it's free. Why would people be showing their passes? Just just wanted to make sure it was clarified that sure. we're not we're not charging admission, right. a daily fee, or taking a pass away. So do you think that should be part of the motion? Or make no, ma'am. No? OK. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Emmerich, for making that decision for us. Thank you. Yeah, it doesn't need to be there. You're okay. fine. If there's nothing else, uh, let's take a vote on that. Sorry, I'm slow. And that motion passes five to zero. Wow. <laughs> that was a tough piece of taffy. City Clerk, our final round of public comments. Are there any? Yes, there is. Okay. Taxpayers in need, please help. Commissioners, if you are the voice of the Northport population, the workforce of the community, the 10,000 school age children, then we are begging you to please reach out to the Sarasota County Commissioners and ask for mosquito traps and dunks so we can fight disease and mosquito outbreaks. With one full-time year-round licensed county spray technician working in Northport, he can't be in multiple neighborhoods trapping mosquitoes and spraying for disease at one time. There are four of them in the city of Sarasota. So if the county and local health department won't do it for us, as a mosquito control district that we pay our taxes to annually. Perhaps you, our elected officials, will get us the tools needed for us to protect ourselves. The dunks go in stagnant water, which is where mosquitoes breed and hatch 500 eggs at a time. The mosquitoes eat the dunks and die and therefore can't become nuisance biters or disease carriers. The mosquito traps attract the mosquitoes near a home and kill them. Every single county impacted by Hurricane Ian and Nicole received them, but not Northport. Why? Why didn't one of the hardest hit communities in Sarasota County not get anything to help combat mosquito outbreaks, which we have now? With some prevention, we would see this level of mosquitoes outside of rainy season. Anything is better than nothing with your help, Commissioners. Thank you. And that's all. Thank you, City Clerk. On to Commission Communications. Given the hour, I am going to hold my report to our next meeting, Commissioner McDowell. I will do the same or else I'll submit it to the clerk to add to the backup. That's a great suggestion. Commissioner Stokes. 
be happy to catch everybody up on my activities at the next meeting. Okay, thank you for that, Vice Mayor White. I just want to give a shout out to the Embracing Our Differences display um, that, that is up, and uh, that's for the whole month. Correct. Oh, I thought it was like 10 oh, eight. days, oh, 11 days. I think it's 19 days. Okay. On, yes. Just really excited to see that here, and I've gotten a lot of uh, positive feedback from people, and um, it's just great to yeah. people know it's out there at Butler Park. Yep. It's a beautiful display. Uh, Commissioner Emmerich. Yeah, I'll do mine tonight since I have none. <laughs> <laughs> city Manager, do you have anything to report? No, Madam Mayor. Deputy City Attorney. Well, since you asked. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you called him City Attorney Slayton, <laughs> <laughs> he might have had something to say. City Clerk, do you have anything to report? I do not. Well, it is my extreme pleasure to say it is 11.15 and I am adjourning the City Commission regular meeting.